Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. I enjoyed watching them. In all of the time that I'd been in Avery's life, I had never seen her have that kind of exchange with her mother. It seemed as if they were forming a really special bond. Avery suggested then that we all go back to my house, our house, as she put it, and watch a movie. We all agreed and Christy wanted us to stop by her apartment so she could get something more comfortable to put on. That had me pretty excited until circumstances intruded. Circumstances being Marjorie calling to tell us to stop by the station. We got there to discover that she and Patrick had been busy as usual. The woman they'd had their eye on, the one who worked in the purchasing department was guilty as hell. The guy they'd been watching wasn't a part of it. He was an ex-con and was trying to remain as clean as he could. But talking to him turned out to be good anyway, because he had an idea of who could have done some of the things Jasper wanted. He also gave Marjorie the name of the guy he was thinking about. Patrick picked that guy up and he was only too eager to make a deal and rat out Jasper, who hadn't paid him. The woman in purchasing turned out to be another of Jasper's lovers, who was also pissed at him. The plan Jasper had given her involved her, not Dana, running off to Mexico with him. She'd waited for him at the bus stop for hours, thinking that they were going to take the big silver dog to Chicago and fly to California from there. A quick trip over the border, and they'd live happily ever after. Her husband was added to the growing list of heartbroken people that Jasper and Dana had trampled over. She was in jail awaiting her arraignment and Marjorie had just finished the unenviable task of filling her husband in on the details of why his wife wouldn't be coming home. They had twin boys, and that poor man had tell his sons that they probably wouldn't be seeing their mom for a very long time. Dave, we have a problem, said Marjorie. I'm gonna have one of my officers stay with you for a while. They took the bait. Huh, I said. Who took what bait? Your wife tried to withdraw the money this afternoon. The bank they went and contacted your bank, and your bank immediately contacted us. I called the bank in Mexico and spoke to a woman there. She explained to me that both Jasper and your wife were extremely upset when they couldn't get the money. Dana tried explaining to the woman who she was and showed her ID and swore that the account was in her name. The bank manager explained to her that the main name on the account was yours and she had been added on later. Since you were the primary account holder, you had every right to suspend or eliminate her ability to withdraw funds from the account, and that was what you'd done. He told her that he'd call the bank to see what was going on and see if it was possible for someone at the other bank to intercede for her. He suggested that she call you to see if there was some sort of mistake or misunderstanding. He said that both Dana and Jasper were acting very antsy then. He had his security guards watch them. Dana pretended to call you on her cell phone. The call she pretended to make resulted in her telling him that you were moving funds around in various accounts and would reinstate her privileges soon. He laughed and told her that she was lying and that not only was she listed as dead in the U.S., but that there was a warrant out for her arrest and for Jasper, who he listed by name. They both ran out of the bank then. They got into a car with what he described as two seedy characters and drove off. I think there's a chance that you may be in danger. So, I'm assigning an officer to protect you for a while. I'm pretty sure that I can handle Jasper, I said. I'm pretty sure you could too, she said. In a face-to-face, one-on-one, unarmed confrontation, but this time he might not be alone. He might not be unarmed and you might not see him coming. Don't worry it won't be for long and I'm pretty sure my officer won't interfere with your life. It's not my life that I'm worried about, I said. I'm trying to make things as normal for Avery as possible. I'm sure Avery will he fine, she said. Who is he? Asked Christy. I need to make sure it's someone good. Why? Asked Marjorie. All of my officers are good. Yeah but there's good and then there's good, said Christy. I don't want someone who looks at this as just another job. We don't need a clock watcher on this. Remember that case in Chicago where the cops left right on time, even though their replacements weren't in position? If something like that happened, I'd be pissed. I thought you might be, smirked Marjorie. That's why I'm sending you. Okay then, smiled Christy. Officer Callahan, this will probably be a tough assignment, said Marjorie. You're gonna have to move in with him for a while. It turned out that Marjorie had given the matter a lot of thought. In terms of conserving both money and manpower, it was the most frugal and logical plan. If Christy hadn't agreed to it, it would have involved rotating shifts of at least three officers or more. In a small town, with other duties and cases to consider, the manpower savings alone would have justified it. Then when you factored in the amount of money going to those officers for protecting us, it was a done deal. Marjorie's biggest concern was whether or not Christy would agree to it. Most other officers had homes and families to consider. Christy didn't. There was also the fact that having a police officer around us 24-7 might grate on our nerves and our need for privacy. But both Avery and I enjoyed spending time with Christy. 
and I was beginning to think that Marjorie had a hidden agenda. The way she looked at me when I was around Christy made me suspicious. She was often telling me things about her daughter, as if trying to explain or justify Christy's behavior or personality. Maybe Marjorie had simply seen this or the possible necessity of it from the beginning and had been laying the groundwork ever since. But over the next few days, we settled into an easy pattern. We woke up, I made us breakfast and we dropped Avery off at school. During the time that Avery was in school, the security officer there watched over her. He sat outside of her classroom and watched her interactions from a distance. He was never close enough to intrude on her or draw the suspicion of her friends, but he was close enough to cut off contact with any adult who approached her or any strange kids who tried to lure her away from her schedule. He'd also been given photos of Dana and Jasper and any other persons of interest, especially people like Linda. None of them would have been allowed within 50 feet of her, let alone allowed to converse with or take her anywhere. Christy stayed with me, seemingly as my new PA. The strange thing was that she was actually good at the job. Of course, us being together so much only served to make us closer. I grew more and more attached to her smile and the way she could make my heart speed up just by glancing at me across a room full of people. When she looked at me that way, all of the people around us just seemed to fade into the background. And it was far worse at home. An endless barrage of yoga pants and tiny t-shirts had me constantly excited. She nearly killed me one night when she stretched out on the sofa only inches away from me in just the t-shirt. I'm all out of yoga pants, she smiled. I have to do laundry. Apparently, she was out of bras too. It was funny. For a man who'd been married to a woman with great curves, Christie's just seemed better. I think that was when I noticed how strange the situation between us was. I was, as I've mentioned, in a constant state of excitement around Christy. And judging from her curves, she was too. But she seemed not to notice the signals we were sending each other. Some of the women at my job noticed it too. They were always telling me how lucky I was to have replaced Dana so quickly and with someone who seemed so much better for me. At first, I laughed and told them that they were very much mistaken. But most of them pointed out things that I had never paid attention to. There were very subtle signs like the fact that whenever I had male engineers or co-workers in my office for consultations or to work together, Christy barely batted an eye. She kept the conversation light and friendly and our coffee cups full. But in a mixed group or when I had women in the office, she hovered around me, constantly touching me. Her conversations were colder and more businesslike and they felt as if they were under scrutiny. Andrea, one of the few in our office who knew why Christy was really there, spoke to me about it. She actually called me on the phone instead of braving the lioness's den as she called my office. I think it's cute, she laughed. She's marking her territory and sending out signals that you are off the market. I was never on the market, I said. I'm mourning a dead wife and trying to get used to being a single dad. Dave, there were all kinds of women here at the office who were surveilling you and trying to position themselves to go after you at the first sign of you being ready to move on. I think most of them wanted to a eh? give you some time to get Dana out of your system so they wouldn't seem like they were unsympathetic. And B, they wanted to wait for you to date someone else first. Nobody wants to be the rebound girl. Those things never work out, and the first one to jump in has to endure all of the shit left over from the previous woman. Men are just not ripe, right after trauma. They need time for their feelings to mature and sort themselves out. And they need time for their long-stored testosterone to drop down to normal. Rebound women are desperate, and they pay for it. They get screwed a lot, and get no emotional attachment to show for it. The guys are afraid to commit again and ready to stick there, into anything that moves, every time it moves. And in the back of your mind, you know it's probably not going to work out. You have to be a masochist to put up with that. But apparently, your Christy is rewriting the rule book as she goes along. Keep me up to date with how things progress. But at home things were a study in frustration. It was almost as if Christy had no idea how she was frustrating me. She wore the sexiest, little outfits around me, almost as if I wasn't a guy, or at least not one she took seriously. On the other hand, if we went out for anything, it didn't have to be going to a restaurant or a movie, it could be as simple as grocery shopping, and since the talk with Andrea, I knew what to look for. Any woman of any age who approached me got the full-on eye and eye treatment from Christy. I and I stood for intimidation and ice. Even Marjorie knew it. She asked me several times how things were going and just smiled about it. Dave, you're an amazing man, she said but I don't envy you. You have a very long, very tough road ahead of you. What do you mean? I asked. Dave, I study people all of the time, she said, and I'm good at it. You like my daughter. You like her a lot, but it's not the way most of the guys like her. My daughter has a really nice body and incredible legs. Men stare at her all the time. 
but you do it differently. I've seen you stare at her mouth for five solid minutes at a time and be so into it that you forget what we were talking about. You've told me at least 11,000 goddamn times how nice she is, and nobody except you has ever said that. Christy seems to be different around you too. It's been years since my daughter acted like a girl. If you only knew how many people thought Christy was not straight. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but she isn't. Since she was about your daughter's age, Christy has been kind of guarded. It's like she wore armor to protect herself, but around you she takes it off. Did you know that Christy has never had a boyfriend or been on a date? She did mention that, I said, but I thought she was yanking my chain. That was why I was so excited when she agreed to go out and eat with you. It has never happened before and now all of a sudden. You guys go everywhere and do all kinds of things together. Patrick told me that you guys were shopping last week before you picked Avery up from school and you were walking through the market with her holding onto your arm. He said you guys were feeding each other samples of food and arguing about what to make for dinner. Yeah, but isn't that normal stuff? I asked. Not for Christy, she laughed. My daughter would usually rather shoot somebody than talk to them. You have no idea how excited I am about this. I'm her mother, Dave. I love my daughter. I want a happy, normal life for her. I don't want her to always be alone. I want her to have someone in her life who loves her and Dave were all on hold. I wish I could tell you more, but that's up to Christy. You hang in there. I think she's worth it. So, I did. The fact of the matter was that Dana no longer factored into my thinking at all. Dana had abandoned both me and Avery for Jasper and a life of crime. She hadn't even cared enough about us to tell us goodbye or try to explain anything. We didn't matter to her, so I couldn't come up with a single reason why she should matter to us. And every day that God sent found me falling for Christy a little bit harder. But it was a very innocent, not even high school type of relationship. We had moved up to the point where she'd put on her little houseware and come and sit on the sofa with me. That was the highlight of my day. If we watched a movie that was scary, I gotta hold her hand. And whenever she thought I deserved it, I got one of those unanticipated kisses that just made time stand still. Then out of the blue, the night of Avery's party changed everything. I was the lone male in a bastion of unrestrained estrogen. I was ordering and fetching food in enough quantity to feed a college football team or a group of screaming, squealing 13-year-old girls. Somehow, they were all wearing different versions of the same sleeping outfits. They all had on a large t-shirt that stopped about mid-thigh, revealing yards of long, thin, tanned legs that would someday become sexy, but at that age, at least to me, seemed too thin and almost insect-like. Despite their budding attractiveness, they are kids to me. The Domino's guy, who couldn't have been more than 16, thought otherwise. As I fumbled for a tip, his jaw dropped and his eyes glazed over. They're all so beautiful, he gasped. Which one is your favorite? Well, one of them is my daughter, I said. So, we can't count her. But other than her, I think the redhead is the prettiest thing I've ever seen in my entire goddamned life. But that's just between us and, and I think I'm gonna tell her you said that, gushed a voice from behind me. I turned so fast it seemed like my head would spin off of my neck. The owner of the voice turned out to be Amanda. Oh, please don't. I whined. She took the pizza boxes from the delivery guy and stepped into my house. I'm pretty sure she needs to know that, smirked Amanda. We don't keep secrets from each other. Is this another inspection? I asked. We just cleaned the place from top to bottom yesterday, but it probably doesn't look like it. Avery is kind of having a party, so you know, there's a bunch of her friends and they're not really the neatest. Dave, please stop, she laughed. I'm on your side, remember? I know that this is the best place for her. I'm not here to look under your sofa for dust bunnies. Oh, I said. In that case, have some pizza. What can I do for you? Her laugh was musical and it only served to remind me how attractive Amanda was. She smiled at me and then took off her coat. She was wearing a Detroit Lions, Calvin Johnson jersey that barely made it to mid-thigh. She pulled off her tennis shoes and left them by the door with the shoes belonging to all the other girls. Then she pulled a pair of fuzzy slippers out of her coat pocket and put them on. I came for the party she smiled. Avery invited me. Oh, I said. It was amazing how stupid I sounded. My tongue seemed to have doubled in size and despite having two degrees in engineering, I was incapable of coming up with a single thought that was above the sophistication of most cavemen. Amanda's long, toned legs had robbed me of conscious thought. So, Dave, she smirked. Where is, and I quote, the prettiest thing you've ever seen in your goddamned life? She's probably in the kitchen, getting more soda, I said. Don't worry, Dave, she laughed. I'm not going to tell her, yet. For now, it'll be our secret. What's gonna be your secret? Asked Christy. 
She looked at Amanda and then at me. And it was not just a glance. It was her full-on, investigation look. She crossed the floor and closed the door, leaving the delivery guy still standing there. Perv. She hissed. Christy, he's like 15, laughed Amanda. He's got a baby face with pimples all over it. He drove here, pointed out Christy. Isn't that shirt a bit short, sis? No shorter than yours, sis, quipped Amanda. My legs are just longer, so it seems shorter. Besides, this is an all-girls party. Who's gonna notice or care? What about Dave? Said Christy, pushing her way between Amanda and me. Sis, I could stand here nude. Right now and Dave wouldn't notice it, laughed Amanda. Now come on, take me to the drinks. It's a kid's party, spat Christy. There's only soda, juice, iced tea, and that stuff they call water. I guess that'll have to do, laughed Amanda. They walked back into the kitchen and then into the den where the horde of girls was playing some kind of game that involved a lot of talking and screaming. After a few moments of standing there, not knowing what to do, I settled down to watch TV until I was needed. The girls were so loud that I had to turn the volume up. What I should have done was gone up to my room to watch it, but I wanted to be close if I was needed. All of the signs were there. I really should have picked up on them, but I was so locked in my quest to watch some of the college football bowl games that I really wasn't paying much attention. Sign number one. There was definitely something going on between Christy and me. Sign number two. Andrea had already warned me that Christy was territorial, with a bit of a temper. Sign number three. Amanda was enjoying herself by teasing me about what I'd said about Christy. Add all of those close together and mix in a bizarre set of circumstances and everything exploded. At some point the game I was watching got boring. I slumped down on the couch and fell partly asleep. My slouching position meant that Amanda didn't see me as she tiptoed out the front door. Unfortunately, my house is shaped like an L. So, Christy, in the den with the girls, caught a glimpse of Amanda out the window, and I guess the best way to describe her behavior in totally professional terms is to say that Christy flipped out. Christy saw Amanda on the porch and launched herself after her, with blood in her eyes. She too, tore straight past me without noticing my slumping form. I of course came fully awake, seeing Christy rush by me. I was just getting to the door as Christy saw Amanda hugging a male form in the shadows of the porch and then kiss him. Christy slammed bodily into the guy, knocking him off the porch and into the rose bushes. She then turned to Amanda and screamed. You knew I liked him. Why would you do that? Amanda just looked confused. I was standing in the doorway, also confused. My heart was beating so hard that I was sure the neighbors could hear it over Christy's screams. It all made sense. I hadn't been able to figure Christy out. It had been very strange between us. The teasing, yet still remaining distant. I had fooled myself into thinking that Christy liked me because I liked her, when all along, she'd simply been being nice to me. We were in the friend zone if anything. Her stunted displays of emotion were probably more a gesture of compassion because she felt sorry for me for the breakdown of my relationship with Dana. I felt like a fool. It just went to show me that like most men, there was simply no way for me to ever understand women. And Marjorie, her veiled hints told me that Marjorie had no idea that her daughter was interested in someone. I felt like the world's biggest fool. And Amanda, she was the worst of the bunch. She'd been teasing me with what I said about Christy since she got here. They were probably just typical 21st century bitches. We used to call them mean girls back in the day. Sure, they were both beautiful, and they took it for granted. They collected compliments and admirers as if they were their due. Compliments didn't mean much to them when they heard it all the time. Perhaps I'd phrased it differently than they were used to hearing it, but then I was six years older than Christy, so maybe language was different. Boy, was I a fool. Maybe I just needed a vacation from women. I just didn't understand them. I had actually been stupid enough to marry and expect to spend my life with a bottle blonde, trailer park bitch, who'd probably been cheating on me since the day I met her. Then I tripped over Christy, whose personality seemed to morph with the wind. I mean, what the hell did I expect? When we first met, we practically hated each other on sight. And over the course of three or four weeks, I was sure that I loved her. All of that just led to me getting kicked in the teeth emotionally, on my own front porch. What an idiot. Here I am, on my own goddamned porch, figuratively holding my tool, while doing my best attempt at being invisible, all while watching the bitch I thought I was falling for, arguing with her friend or fake sister over some idiot they both clearly like. Screw this noise. This is one of those times that only a long stretch of road and a loud song can fix. But I can't bail. I have to think about Avery. That's what dads do. I have to suck up my pain once again, so my little girl can be happy. Avery deserves her party. She's been through a lot. She's been through more than enough. I turned to go check on her, 
But before my feet actually move, the drama starts again. The guy Christy had slammed into my rose bushes got up and staggered over to the porch. Screw you. Christy screamed at him. You're as bad as she is. I'm glad I didn't waste my time on you. How stupid do I have to be? And I thought you were pretty goddamn special. Um, there are kids in the house, Christy, said Amanda. You need to cut out the swearing. You, you're crazy, hissed the guy from the bushes. Christy, you could have killed me. I think my shoulder is dislocated. And your timing sucks. Then I noticed that the guy had on a police uniform under his coat. I guess that made sense. They'd probably known each other for a long time. Brian. Christy gasped. Suddenly. I didn't know that was you. I how boy. I saw my sister kissing you and... I thought. No, you didn't. He said. You didn't think at all. You just came out of nowhere and knocked out of me for nothing. Yes, Christy. Amanda kissed me. We like each other. And you know what? This is a really screwed up situation. Christy. I stalked you for months trying to get you interested in me. I lost track of how many times I asked you out. Bullshit. Hissed Christy. You never asked me out. I don't even remember talking to you. If you had asked me out, I'd have just told you no, and we'd have been straight. Why the hell would I want to go out with you? I don't do that crap. I don't go out. I don't even like you. You're being ridiculous. Amanda. She's crazy. He whined. I know she's your sister, and we have to be careful, but she is out of her goddamned mind. You heard her say less than two minutes ago that she liked me. Now, she's claiming that she doesn't because she's pissed because she saw you kiss me. We're supposed to kiss. I mean we are engaged. Christy, you just missed your chance. Deal with it. Deal with what? Hissed Christy back. Deal with my sister's obvious bad taste in men? I don't like you that way, Brian. I hate to deflate your ego, but I never even noticed your fumbling attempts to get me to notice you. You're basically furniture. Most people don't pay you any attention when they step into a room. Amanda, she noticed me, he whined. If she didn't whine, she'd just try to kill me out of jealousy. You heard her screaming at you. You heard her say she liked me, but it's too late. I'm all yours, baby. Amanda suddenly burst out laughing. Brian, I'm all yours too. I think Christy thought you were someone else, she said. No, I didn't, said Christy. Her pale skin was beginning to turn red with embarrassment. I just knocked the shit out of you because you were standing on my porch, kissing my sister in broad daylight with impressionable kids in the house. It was my way of showing you how much I don't like you and how small of an impression you made on me. Oh no, Christy, smirked Amanda. We both know what you thought. No, we don't, said Christy angrily. And anyway, what was I supposed to think? You've been running around in that short short jersey since you got here. And you keep talking to him about secrets. You and I are supposed to tell each other everything. And now I'm finding out that you're engaged to this dweeb and you have some kind of secret with my Dave. It's not my secret, sis, said Amanda. He just didn't want you to know what he said about you to the pizza kid. So, I was having fun making him squirm. He should have told that pizza perv. That the pizza needed more sauce, spat Christy. What did he say about me anyway? He said you were the prettiest thing he's ever seen in his entire goddamn life, said Amanda. Her? Laughed Brian. Christy's already reddening face got redder, and she clenched her fists. And what did you mean calling him your Dave? Asked Amanda. I didn't say that. Spat Christy. Yeah, you did. Guffawed Brian. I gotta get out of here. Said Christy. You two deserve each other. You're both crazy. Christy stepped into the doorway and noticed me standing there for the first time. Oh God. She said. How long have you been standing there? Um, not long the whole time. I said. Great. She said. Just great. Give me your keys. I'm going for a drive. Christy. Nobody is gonna let you drive their car, said Amanda. I have a better idea anyway. While I was in the house, watching those little girls get all sugared up on soda, I noticed a really nice deck out back. You two should go out there and have a talk. Christy stared across at me. As soon as her eyes met mine, some of her anger faded. Where were you? She asked. I fell asleep on the couch, I said, shrugging my shoulders. I knew Avery was fine. You were with her. I was waiting for the girls to exhaust themselves so I could eat whatever was left of all of the food that I'm paying for and not getting any of. Well, you'd have been out of luck, she said with a hint of a smile. Those girls are so ramped up on soda and excitement that they'll be awake all night. There probably won't be a crumb left of anything. Oh, I said. Well, as long as Avery is happy. She hates it when you call her that, she smiled. There's only one thing she hates more. What's that? I asked. When you're not around to call her anything, she said. And I h. She stopped and bit one of those soft lips of hers. 
All right, if we're gonna have this talk, we may as well be comfortable. I'll get us some pizza. If there's anything left, you get your iPad and meet me on the deck with a blanket. I just nodded. I'll watch the kids, said Amanda. They'll probably have to watch you. Spat Christy. You may as well be one of them. The worst one. Drinking beer? Sneaking off to kiss your boyfriend at an all-girls party? Love you too, sis, laughed Amanda. You go home, Christy said, glaring at Officer Brian. You've caused enough trouble for one night. Okay, Christy, he said. How about a good night kiss? Are you out of your goddamned mind? Hissed Christy. There's no way I'd ever kiss you. Um, not that I won't spend the rest of my life eternally grateful for that, he smirked. But I was talking about Amanda. Oh God, whatever, hissed Christy. She looked at me, on the verge of laughter, and turned her fury on me. Get the iPad, she barked. Or are you waiting to kiss her too? My feet were moving before she finished talking. Don't forget the blanket. She yelled at my retreating back. Davy, she yelled before I'd gone too far. Get that thick, soft one from the hall closet. The last things I heard as I headed up the stairs was Christy yelling at Brian and Amanda. Hey Officer Octopus, get your hands off of her body, she hissed. And you, Amanda Hot Pants, don't forget you're an officer of the court. As I hurried through the house, the excited shrieks of teenage girls told me that Avery was fine, but maybe there was another, older girl that needed my attention. Under a moon so big and bright that it nearly filled the night sky, I met her on my deck. It was slightly breezy, with just a hint of a chill in the air. But then again, in Michigan, there's a chill in the air sometimes in August. So, why do we need the iPad? I asked. Are we gonna play a game to relax us before you lower the boom on me? Davy? I'm only mean to people that I really don't like, and to people that I'm ambiguous about, and to people that I like a lot, she said. But isn't that just about everybody? I laughed. Did you come out here so we could talk or to make jokes? She asked. I won't say another word, I said. No. Davy, you have to talk too, she said angrily. Okay. I'll talk without saying anything, I said. She nodded. Davy, I think that you have feelings for me, she said. And, and this is the part where you let me down easy because you don't return those feelings, I blurted out. The things that I thought meant you like me were just you being friendly and I was mistaken. No, you idiot. I like you too, she hissed. And didn't I tell you not to talk? Nope. You told me to talk without saying anything, I smirked. And yet you're still saying shit, she hissed. Look I'll signal you when I want you to talk. Okay? I just nodded. Davy, we have a problem, she began. She spread the blanket over us and snuggled in next to me as she spoke. I don't like people. It's not men. I don't like women either. So if you make one of those gender fluid cracks I'll slap the shit out of you. Say something. I already knew all of that. Your mom kind of told me. I said. My mom likes you, she said. She needs to mind her own goddamned business. She, I began, before a withering glance caused me to shut my mouth so fast that I bit my tongue. Davy, for some reason, you seem to really like me, so I just decided that I need to warn you. It won't work. I'm, I'm broken. So, I'm gonna try to explain it to you so you don't waste your time. Even as she spoke, I saw tiny tears in the corners of her eyes. She opened up a Google window on my iPad and typed in a web address. It was the local newspaper's website. She scrolled through content and opened several stories, each on its own tab. Without unwrapping her arm from around my waist, she placed the iPad on her laps. There was a headline. Hero cop killed in action. Leaves grieving wife and daughter. There were two pictures and the story was dated 17 years prior. Christy would have been about 11 years old and I'd been 15. In the first picture, the cop who died seemed like one of those guys with the right stuff. The guys who always end up running for Congress or President. They always look prosperous or heroic. But who really knows? All of the people we have in Washington right now look good in pictures and they all have sterling resumes. But truthfully, I can't think of any of them who are really worth a damn. Looking at the picture, I was reminded of a younger John McCain. He was one of the few who had the guts to stand up. So maybe Christie's dad had been an okay guy too. I looked at the next picture. Marjorie had been ridiculously hot. The smile she wore told me that they hadn't taken that picture at that time. It had to have been taken before her husband was killed. Looking at the photo also showed me that there was something different about Marjorie now. There was something missing. The sparkle in her eyes in that photo was something the Marjorie of today does not possess. In its place there's a sense of duty, there's a different type of focus, but that's spark and gone. Perhaps when we love someone that deeply, so deeply in fact that we swear they're a part of us or that they own a piece of our hearts, it isn't just a figure of speech. 
Maybe giving someone our hearts is a true physical thing, and they take that piece of us with them when they die. I get it, Christy, I said. Your dad was a hero. He was a cop, and his death motivated you to become a cop too. And you loved him so much that no other man will ever hold a place in your heart. I totally. I have no idea how she got that tiny hand of hers from under the blanket that quickly, but she did. And she used it to clamp my mouth shut, painfully. When she released it, I was sure that her stubby fingernails had dug furrows in the sensitive skin around my lips. My dad dying threw me into a funk, she said. My dad and I were really close. He left behind a void that I just couldn't seem to fill. I felt so empty. My mom couldn't help. How could she? She felt it too. I went off the rails for a while. I got worse and worse. And about that time, Amanda came along. Davy, I blamed everyone. I blamed Patrick. He was my dad's partner. I blamed him for being too goddamn slow. Two robberies. One in which my dad was killed, and the one where Amanda's parents were murdered. The only thing they had in common was the fact that Patrick did things by the book. He always waited for backup. Davy at 13 and 14 years old I got wild. I did some really dumb things and made some really, really bad choices. She showed me the next headline. 14-year-old girl goes missing. I didn't choose this one, Davy, she said. I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. The latest thing I'd tried was smoking. No one would sell cigarettes or beer to a 14-year-old. But if I hung around outside of the store long enough, the right kind of guys always showed up. I hadn't done anything bad until then. Maybe I got drunk and let some lonely man look under my clothes for a can of beer or a pack of cigarettes, but there was no touching allowed. Ever. And getting drunk or high seemed to be the only thing that took the pain away. So, I did what I had to do to get rid of the pain for just a little while. But Davy, I was running on luck and one day that luck ran out. He picked me up outside of the same goddamned store I was always at. I got into his car willingly. Even as she spoke, she was squeezing my hand so hard I thought she would shatter my fingers. He had the strongest weed I had ever smoked. I felt weird after smoking it. I fell asleep and when I woke up, it was the pain that woke me up. It felt as though he had stabbed me. I tried to scream. He clamped his hand over my mouth. Then he pulled one of his dirty socks off of his foot and shoved it into my mouth until I almost choked on it. He told me that if I screamed again, he would kill me. He wasn't some huge, muscular, scary guy, Davy. He was probably in his late fifties. He had gray hair and a receding hairline. He wasn't tall or even big. He looked like one of my friend's granddad. But when he shoved that sock in my mouth, I knew he meant business. I knew I had to get out of there. So, I just nodded at him to make him think that I understood what he meant and then bolted for the door. He caught me before I made two steps and yanked me backwards by my hair. My feet went out from under me and I landed on my back so hard that it knocked the wind out of me. He picked me up and threw me down on the bed and finished what he'd started before. Davy, I knew what sex was, but other than the mechanics of what went where, I knew nothing. I mean I knew that boys and men like looking at my body, but that was it. Three days, Davy. He had me for three days. He assaulted me over and over again. I was so lucky Davy. At the time, I just wanted to die. I was hoping that he would just assault me to death so the pain and the fear could end. But I had no idea how lucky I actually was. The first way that I was lucky was that for some reason, I found out later that he had done what he did to me, many times before. He would take a few girls, do his thing, and then move to a different state before the cops could figure out his pattern. Before Michigan, he'd been in New York. The cops there were very smart, and had almost caught him. They were so close at catching him that he'd had to leave town before he could clean up after himself. As a result, his photo, taken from the driver's license picture of a wallet he'd left behind was available to cops across the country. That photo may have saved my life. His usual pattern was to take a girl, assault her, and then kill her. I already told you that I'd lasted three days. I was sure he was ready to kill me too, but every time he had me, he talked about wanting me just one more time. What finally saved me was two things. The first was that after three days, he had nothing left to eat in the cheap motel room he was renting, and having sex practically nonstop for three days had him exhausted and starving. He decided to go out and get food. Then he'd come back and kill me after he'd had one more time with me. He was very confident in the way he'd secured me to the bed. He'd used very tight, very rough nylon ropes that cut into my arms and my ankles if I tried to move them. He was also very sure that I would remain silent. The gag he used barely allowed me to breathe. So there was no way that I'd be drawing enough breath to scream very loudly. The second thing that saved me was Patrick. I'd been missing for three days. There had been search parties and groups of people searching the woods in every possible location that people could think of. 
some of them several times. My photo was on posters and billboards all over the county. Everyone was searching for me. And that was the problem. There was no one looking for him. It was pure chance, but only partially so. As I said before, the police in New York had that photo of him. They'd put it out so every law enforcement agency in the country knew of him. Patrick spent a lot of time going over those notices. So when he saw him in a convenience store, something clicked. Patrick never said a word. But he followed him back to the motel. He had a good idea of what had happened. He watched him go into the room and called for backup, but then he kicked the door open and followed him in. There was no fight. The monster became a lamb immediately. When facing little girls, he was as tough as nails. When facing a full-grown man, he was as soft as a cotton ball. Patrick tied his hands with the same ties the monster had used on me. He called an ambulance and my mother. It was hard for Patrick. He had to put his feelings aside. When all the while he wanted to wrap his fingers around the monster's neck and choke him to death, I was taken to a hospital immediately. After they treated my physical wounds and bruises, they began to notice the real damage. I had gradually withdrawn inside of myself. They tried everything they could think of, and I was finally sent to a facility where I could be treated and monitored around the clock. They were certain that within a month, I'd be fine and ready to go home. One month became three months, six months, and then a year passed. They were no closer to figuring out what was wrong with me than they were the day I walked in there. I spent my 15th and 16th birthdays locked away. It finally took a specialist from California to figure it out. They'd been concentrating on my traumatic experience with the monster so much that they hadn't looked into what led in into the behavior that put me into his grasp. It had been my father's death that had started me spiraling into the narcotics and liquor and stupid behavior in the first place. Davy, I had what was called attachment syndrome. Lots of people get minor cases of it. You've heard of people who love someone so deeply that they claim they want to die too, when they pass. It's like all of those older people who lose a spouse and they mysteriously die within a few weeks or a month because they just couldn't live anymore without that person. Well, that was how I was about my dad. Don't get me wrong, I love my mom too. But Davy, my dad was everything to me. It took another year before I was ready to go home. I was homeschooled for the rest of high school. I still wasn't ready to blend back into normal society as a whole, and it was decided that high school was simply too intense of an emotional environment to plunge me into. For a few years after that I saw a therapist regularly, and I'd gotten to the point where I was able to function and live on my own. I started out in a community college and lived in my little apartment, close to my mom's house and Patrick and Amanda's house too. Amanda was doing almost the same thing that I was. We both wanted to stay near home and family. Amanda stayed because even now when we're nearing 30, she feels so connected to Patrick that she can't see leaving him. She has it good, better than I do. She remembers her parents, but she has so many good memories with Patrick that they've faded in importance. If you mention her dad, her mind immediately clicks to Patrick. With me on the other hand, my dad's death is still a very raw and open wound. I'm 28 years old. For years ago, I'd been in therapy for 10 years and they decided that I was never going to get any better. I'm okay with Patrick and my mom and Amanda. After years of mistakes and adjustments, I'd gotten to the point where we felt like a family. Oh sure, Davy, I'm not fixed. Not by a long shot. The monster won. He never made it to trial, Davy. It was decided that our small town jail was simply too small to hold him and take care of him properly. Besides, here there was only one case pending against him and my case was small potatoes. He didn't even kill me. So, he was sent back to New York, with my case added to his tally. As I said, he never made it to trial. Child molesters and men who kill children don't do well in prison, Davy. Surprisingly enough, none of the inmates bothered him or attacked him for the first few days. They just avoided him. The prison officials think that the inmates, all of them, left him alone to make the guards believe that he was safe. And then one afternoon, just before dinner, they found him, or most of him. I think they found one of his arms first. A couple of days later they found a foot, and then a leg. The very last thing they found, hidden in plain sight in the garage where the laundry truck entered and left from, was his head. They had beaten him to the point where his facial features were unrecognizable and stuffed his tool in his mouth. They had to use DNA to be sure all of the body parts were his. Davy it turned out that they hadn't cut him up after they killed him. They had literally ripped his limbs off of his body while he was still alive. Another strange part of it was the way they hid him. Davy, getting into the garage, meant that whoever had placed the head there could have easily hidden in a truck and escaped. Either that, or they were a trustee who was so close to being set free that leaving would have been stupid. But if they were on the verge of being set free, why risk being a part of a murder? So close to getting out? 
The weirdest thing of all was that the prison officials never bothered to even investigate what happened to him. There were no searches. No prisoners were questioned and business inside the prison just went back to normal. The same old gangs that had been at each other's throats had declared a truce and all worked together to mete out justice in their own brutal manner. All of their dislikes and squabbles were temporarily put aside. I guess it was easy because all of them had mothers or sisters or daughters and they all hated him. Once they'd handled him, they went back to fighting and squabbling and hating each other as usual. But despite that, he still had his victory, Davy. He still had me. Even after all of the therapy, I'm not exactly what you'd call normal. Sure, I can be around people, but it's like I don't feel anything. I can be around people, but I don't like them. Davy, you saw my interaction with Brian. All of that was true. Thinking back on it, he must have hinted around about asking me out, but it never even registered on my consciousness. I have never dated. I have never wanted to. I don't join clubs. I don't go to church. I avoid people. I have difficulty forming attachments. Patrick is the senior officer on our staff. He should by rights have the office next to my mom's. Why the hell is Pat still going out on patrol and wearing a uniform? Davy, he stalled his career because of me. I'm a good cop, but my uses are limited. I'm not allowed to drive because of my speeding. That's my dad's fault. We'll get to that some other time. I can also be genuinely hostile, even to the victims. I think you saw some of that. And I just seem to rub people, even other cops the wrong way. So, if Patrick wasn't my partner, I'd be sitting behind a desk. Men, even the cops, seem to think that I'm okay to look at. So, I usually keep myself hidden under my uniform and glasses. It's just easier. I had my whole life planned out. I was doing what I wanted to do, Davy, and then you came along and screwed it all up. I started to say something, but the words died in my throat as I remembered that this was her talk. Davy, you and I started out on the wrong foot, she continued. I was as wrong as two left shoes. We went to your office to get you to identify your wife's body. You were an innocent victim, but I treated you badly. That's just me. I have difficulty relating to people's feelings. But you didn't back down. You got right back in my face and gave it back to me. I respected that. And of course, having Pat remind me that we had a job to do helped. But truly, it was something else. Davy, your eyes reminded me a lot of my dad. You don't look like him at all. You don't even act like him. When I got back to the office, I pulled out a picture of him and your eyes don't even look like his. I realized then that you have nothing in common with my dad, except for one thing. I liked you. That was where I went when Patrick showed you the body. I guess I should have stayed with you too, but I really needed to get away from you. And when you started to break down thinking that B, Dana was dead, I couldn't help it. I just needed to wrap my arms around you and try to let you know. Davy, that was the first time I willingly touched anyone except for my mom, Manda, or Pat. In more years than I want to think about. It was really special too. I didn't want to let go of you. And Avery, oh God, Davy. She's me. Only she's backwards. Every detail about us is reversed. I lost my dad. She lost her mom. I freaked out and became a loner. She reached out to you with everything she has. That brave little girl threw herself at the person she was closest to, and Davy, you caught her. Don't you see it? Avery is so much stronger than I was. And so much smarter. I had every advantage. I had two parents who loved me and a normal, loving home life. Avery had a mother who ignored her for a rotating string of boyfriends. She had a grandmother who sees her as free labor and a usable revenue stream. That little girl was on the edge of a cliff. Davy out of all of her mom's boyfriends, and there were a lot of them. You were the one she loved. But she's just been through the mill too many goddamn times. Dana would bleed guys dry, and after they either ran out of money or got tired of screwing her, they were gone. Some of them treated Avery nicely. Others treated her too nicely, if you know what I mean. I don't know if you know this or not, but you aren't Dana's first husband. You're actually her third. And as far as Avery knows, Dana really does love you. But she just seems to get caught up in situations that she can't get out of. And Avery was always afraid that one day she'd wake up and you'd be gone, or that she'd wake up and Dana would be dragging her out of your house and back to her grandma's trailer because you guys broke up. She had already learned not to show any kind of weakness or not to show that she was too interested in anything, because as soon as she did, it was taken away from her. Dana and Linda are like sharks. So, she held you at arm's length. She called you her stepdad and things like that. But she loved the things you did with her. Like helping her with her homework and going to her school stuff. On the few occasions when she got into trouble, and it was mostly over attendance, because Dana or Linda would keep her out of school. You actually went down to the school and spoke to her principal. Davy, she was always so proud to have you go to her school. She may have told the kids, 
He's my stepdad, but that was never how she felt. That little girl loves you, and she loves being around you. She feels loved and protected and, Davy, I, I feel that way too. I wrapped my arms around her and squeezed her tightly to me. The next thing I knew Christy was bawling her eyes out. Christy, it's okay. I told her. It's a really good thing. She stopped sobbing and looked up at me. How the hell is it a good thing? She hissed almost angrily. Because I love you too, I said. Oh God, you're so stupid, she cried. Davy, I just told you about me. Don't you get it? You don't want me in your life, dummy. I'm broken. We would never have a normal relationship. You'll only end up leaving me or cheating on me. You'll end up hurt and I'd end up back in a nut house. Well, you're stuck with me, I said. Christy, I will never leave you. But I'm never going to be a normal woman, she said. I'm not going to be somebody you can kiss or somebody for you to have sex with. Christy, sex is important, I said. But it ain't the end of the world. And we already kiss all of the time. When? She asked. I reminded her of a few of them and her face got as red as her hair. I just held her for a while and stroked that beautiful hair until she fell asleep. I felt good. I'm not sure how long I sat there before Amanda spoke. I take it that things went well, she smirked. I nodded. Dave, I need some sleep, she yawned. It's three in the morning. All the food is gone and those girls are still going strong. They're all so damn cheerful and nice. I don't ordinarily get to see normal kids. I deal mostly with situations involving family drama, trauma, or broken homes. Against all odds, Avery is a very nice, very normal little girl. She's in there now so happy. She could burst, telling all of those other little girls how her dad makes the best pancakes in the world. Dave, what exactly is vegan bacon? Is it some of that disgusting stuff they make with tofu? I laughed, and Christy woke up. Not you again? She smiled. I thought you had your own man. Amanda started laughing too. I'll get Avery to show me where I can sleep, she said. I'll be expecting some of those pancakes in the morning. And it worked out almost exactly as Amanda thought. The next morning at around 11, Christy and I awoke and went to make pancakes. We expected to have five or six very hungry little girls, ready to eat and were sorely disappointed. Even Avery did not want to get up. Dad, we were up all night, she whined. I'll be up later, I promise. Go play with Christy. Avery, aren't you hungry? I asked. Nope, I ate so much pizza, she mumbled. I may never eat again. I just want to sleep. I went back to the kitchen, wondering what I'd do with all of the pancakes we made. It was neither a problem or a surprise to find that we had three eager-looking guests. Not only had Officer Brian stopped by for an actual introduction, but within a few moments of his arrival, Marjorie arrived. And a few moments later, Patrick appeared on my doorstep. They were all grinning, as if they'd won the lottery. Just like Comey and Mueller, I was sure there was collusion afoot. A few days later, Marjorie got me alone. So, Dave. Are you and Christia involved? She asked. Before I could answer her, Christy stuck her head in the door. Yes, Mom. We're involved. Davy, we have to pick Avery up from school. She has tryouts tonight. Should I come? Asked Marjorie. What's she trying out for? Swimming, said Christy. She's really G. She gets that from me, said Marjorie excitedly. I was a swimmer when I was young. I was on the team too. Mom, you were an alternate reserve, said Christy. You were never in a meet. Daddy said you never even got wet. He? I saw what was coming and immediately clamped my arms around her. She snuggled into my chest and the tears came out. It's okay, honey, I said. Remembering your dad is a good thing. It's also good for you to get past the pain of remembering. Someday, you'll be able to remember him without feeling the pain and actually enjoy looking back on your times together. Davy, where were you when all of those useless shrinks were trying to get into my head? She asked. She wiped her tears and held on to to me. Mom, he said that was where you guys met. He was at one of your swim meets and he saw you sitting on the bench beside the pool, cheering for your team. Marjorie nodded her head and Christy and I opened our arms to include her in the hug. Even as I wrapped an arm around Marjorie, Christy got up on her tiptoes and kissed me. Now let's listen the story from Dana's perspective. A large, sweaty man was on top of me. I wrapped my arms around his waist and pulled him closer. I had learned the hard way that it was dangerous to seem uninterested, so I played my part. Oh baby, you're getting it, all of it. I mumbled just loud enough to sound spontaneous, but soft enough to make him think I was being discreet. I had to keep coming up with new lines every day. A lot of the men who used me were regulars, and I couldn't risk them getting bored. Once I saw he was fully into it, I let my mind drift. My thoughts always went back to the same place. 
How could I have been so damn foolish? I had everything. The perfect life. The perfect man. He had a great career, good looks, and loved my child as if she were his own. Dave was obsessed with me. Seeing the way he tried to destroy Jasper, just for trying to touch my body, brought that fact home to me. Truthfully, I loved that. And I often mentioned it to Jasper when he pissed me off. But now, almost a year after Jasper's dumb plan blew up in our faces, all I can do is wish that I'd never gotten involved with Jasper. It was a stupid thing, but it was something my mother had drummed into me since the day that I even knew what boys were. She told me to always, always, always keep a spare. She also taught me exactly how to get them to do whatever I wanted and how to keep them interested. Of course, when you're built like I am, getting a man is no great feat most of the time. They take one look at my body and it gets really hard to get rid of them. Dave was different. When we first started going out, he kept his hands to himself. It was something I wasn't used to. What I was accustomed to was guys who couldn't wait to get some. Some of them couldn't even wait to get their hands on me. I usually had to fight them off while hinting around that if they wanted to get anywhere, they had to take me someplace nice or do something nice for me. Dave started out taking me to nice places and didn't want anything in return. In fact, I had to make the first moves on Dave, because everywhere we went there was a waitress or some other bitch who was clearly interested in him. Don't get me wrong, Dave isn't one of those hot, sexy, beautiful men who attract women like some sort of sex symbol, he's just a really nice guy with a great personality. The thing that comes across most is that he's solid and kind. He's the kind of guy you can count on, and he's simply not the kind of guy who's ever going to hit you, for any reason. After a few weeks of Dave, I was hooked. Another thing about him was that Dave was the real deal. He often said or did things that just reduced me to mush. There was one time that I'd gone home to mom's and ended up letting mom draw me into her bullshit. Half of the guys in her trailer park knew that my mom was available. If you showed up with a little bit of money or a little bit of weed, you could get laid. So that afternoon, it had been a while since I'd been high, and I got lured into joining in. It wasn't a big deal. There were only three or four guys there, and I was sure that two of them were definite possibilities of being my daughter's biological father. The problem was that I was supposed to go out with Dave that night, and by the time I got home my body looked like I'd been in a sex fest with multiple partner and that he'd have known instantly what I'd been doing. So, I used one of my mom's tricks. I called him and told him that I was really upset because we couldn't go out that night. I told him that my babysitter had canceled on me at the last minute. Dave didn't even pause. No problem, he said. Bring her with us. She's gonna have to get used to me anyway, and I can use the time to get to know her. Dave, you know that if we bring her along, we won't be able to, um, you know, afterwards? I hinted. Dana, he said in the same tone, I love spending time with you. That's why we go out. Anything else is extra. I'd go out with you even if we didn't do anything. You're worth it. You're kind of special. I hope we have a very long time together, maybe four. Well anyway, I have to spend some time around her anyway. So tonight we'll put us on hold and do something she likes. Without even trying to he'd reduced me to mush. I was sure that he'd been about to say that he wanted us to be forever, when he caught himself. And the brat is nothing like me. Sure, she plays a good game, but I could tell that she liked Dave from the beginning. She was always asking me if she could go out on my dates with him. Then she'd act like she was bored or not having fun, just to get his attention. And once we became partially exclusive, things got even better. Partially exclusive meant that we promised to only have sex with each other, and Dave kept his promise. I broke mine the same night. When Dave and I got engaged, my mom told me I was making a huge mistake, but Avery was one happy little girl. For my part, I saw myself as being able to relax and not worry about where my next rent payment was coming from. I kind of thought that I deserved Dave and our life together. But mostly, I just loved the way he made me feel. When we first got married, I stopped. For a couple of years, there were no more extracurricular activities for me. And then, I guess what we had became mundane. I guess I saw myself as too special and too young to be off the market. And it was Dave's fault as much as it was mine. The guy was always telling me how beautiful and sexy I was. And I figured that what he didn't know wouldn't hurt him. The first few times were just plain old innocent fun at mom's. There was no risk involved. None of those guys would dare say a word. They all knew that one of them was Avery's father. And they knew that if Dave found out and divorced me, I'd take them all to court and put the winner on child support. None of them wanted that. None of them saw themselves as daddy material. The shitty thing about it was that one of them was. And all of those guys were about the same age as Dave. A couple of them were older. I'd been screwing those guys since I was a teenager, and none of them had really grown up. And those trips to mom's made everybody happy. Dave got to spend more time with Avery. Avery not only got to spend time with her stepdad, but he bought her a lot of stuff. She always hit it. 
like it was their secret, but I went through her closet regularly. And as I mentioned, my daughter isn't hard like me. A lot of that is Dave. She was eight years old when Dave and I got together, so she's been spoiled for most of her conscious life. Avery tries to pretend that she's tough, but she's not. Avery is transparent to everyone except Dave. She calls him her stepdad and emphasizes step. Anyone with a brain can see that she's trying to draw him out. What she wants more than anything else is for him to ask her if she could just call him her dad. My mom thinks it's funny. And Dave loves my daughter so much that he's afraid to offend her. So, he'll never ask her. My life was perfect. Why did I screw it up? It was of course Jasper. He wanted me so badly from the first second that he walked into our office that anybody could see it. And I loved that. I teased him for months. What about your wife? I asked. Don't you love her? Don't you have kids? I married her because we have kids, he spat. I knocked her up and had to marry her. And the bitch gets pregnant every time I look at her. Screw her. Screw her kids. You're worth it. In a lot of ways, he reminded me of Dave. Not in attitude or looks, but those infamous three words, you're worth it. It was something that my life with Dave no longer was exciting. The thought that a man would willingly risk his marriage and his family just to get something that cost me nothing was too goddamned exciting to turn down. I told myself that Dave would never find out. I mean, neither of us was going to say a word. We both had too much to lose, especially me. Jasper may not have loved his wife, but I loved Dave and wanted to spend the rest of my life with him. Dave was my life. He was also the difference between me ending up like my mother or worse and me having a happy life. My mom will end up 80 years old, as wrinkled as raisin and still rocking a mini skirt and trying to screw as much as she can. So, I did it. I screwed Jasper. And the amazing thing about it was that after you took away the fact that we were both risking our marriages and our families, it wasn't that good. The sex fest and my mom's trailer were better. Plain old married sex with Dave was much better. So, I never intended to do it again. But Jasper kept suggesting things. And he started coming up with things I had never tried. Now I've screwed a lot of guys in a lot of ways. So there just aren't a lot of things I haven't done or had done to me. So, some of those times, out of pure curiosity, I screwed him. And every time, every goddamn time, I swore it would be the last. But he kept coming up with off-the-wall shit. In the end, it was the movies that ruined it. Adult movies made me Jasper's 304. One day, he showed me an adult movie on his phone. Big deal, I said. Mine are bigger than hers and mine are real. Yeah, but she's a professional actress, he said. That shit is so hot. I'm not sure if he was trying to piss me off or turn me on, but he had somehow thrown down the gauntlet. After all, if there was one thing I could do, it was sex. Everyone has a go to skill. My husband's is math. My mom's is narcotics. And mine is, was, and probably always will be is having sex. I had previously decided to get my shit together and stop cheating on Dave, but I decided to give Jasper one more for the road. And I was gonna leave him ruined. After what I intended to do to him, the scumsucker would consider every other woman on the planet a waste of his time. But he would never have me again. So, we got to the motel, and Jasper intended for us to duplicate what they'd done in his adult clip. It was a 15 minute clip that featured a lot of sex. We watched it several times so I could learn the lines duplicate the movements. He used his iPhone to film us. I was sure that I was more than a match for some 20 something blonde. I duplicated her BJ, almost perfectly movement for movement. It was Jasper who ruined it. We had to start all over again. The next time, we made it past the BJ. He literally threw me onto the bed on my back and started screwing me. I matched that 304 movement. Jasper had just forced into me and started screwing me like the guy on the screen was doing that degenerate little 304 he was working with. That bitch obviously had no nerves connected to her lower body, and she just laid there grinning like an idiot, while her Neanderthal partner screwing her wildly. Okay, I said hating him. I can't do that. So, you're saying that some 19-year-old girl with braces, bleached blonde hair and fake jugs, can outscrew you? He asked. I, I guess so, I said. This shit was a real blow to my ego. Of course, she can, Dana, he said. Like I told you, she's a professional. She's trained for this. Her facial expressions? That mixture of pain and pure lust, topped off with a sardonic smile. Those moans that tell you that she wants it, while acting like she can barely stand it. Dana, she's acting. None of it is real. They do multiple takes of every shot, and they stop between positions. And if you look closely, as a matter of fact, the best actor on that screen has to be the guy. Think about it, he has to pretend that he can actually feel something. They're actors, Dana. 
and you're out of your league. You screw a lot, but they're professionals. That little bitch probably terrifies hookers. There was no way you could win. It's like me trying to out-quarterback Tom Brady or outrun one of those Jamaican sprinters. It just ain't gonna happen. Then why'd you have me do it? I asked. Forget it. It doesn't matter. This was our last time together. I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, I definitely enjoyed it. He smirked. But there was far more to this than just my personal enjoyment. There was a purpose behind all of this. People talk. They talk all the time. And for a while, they've been saying that you were about to put me on a shelf. And I couldn't let that happen. I just love your body. Now I don't have to worry about losing that. It'll be me who decides when things between us are done. What makes you think that? I asked. Oh, it's not a thought, he laughed. It's a fact. He pulled out his phone and showed me the video of us trying to duplicate the on-screen antics of the two adult stars. Okay, so you're gonna show everyone that I'm not as good as some adult movie girl, I said. Big deal. Dana, I'm surprised at you, he said. This video was never made to embarrass you or point out any limitations on your part. I have no intention of showing it to everyone. This video was made for an audience of one. So, even smaller deal, I said. You can go home and jack off to seeing yourself screwing me that one last time. All you want. It won't change anything and I meant. I never said that I was the intended person, he said. I was thinking about how your husband would enjoy seeing it. He's kind of a straight arrow, isn't he? He'd probably throw you and your daughter out and you'd end up back in that trailer park with your mom, right? You son of a bitch, I hissed. You're married too. And you have more kids than I do. You have just as much to lose. Not really, he smiled. I give less than a shit about my wife and those goddamn kids. I would look extremely favorably upon a divorce. As a matter of fact, I've been avoiding pulling the trigger for years. Here's my phone. Call the home number and tell her. But you'd be cutting your own throat. Because my wife will definitely call your husband. And my kids don't give a shit about me. We are not a close family. But I believe that your hubby loves your daughter. He never seems to mind taking care of her while you and I are holed up in a motel room. From then on it was business as usual, at least on the surface. But inwardly, my heart was never in it. Jasper had me over a barrel and I was working my butt off to find a way out of his blackmail without destroying my marriage. There was no joy in our couplings. As I've mentioned, I never had any feelings for Jasper. I'd just been doing it for the thrill of doing something that I knew was wrong. But after that day, not only was I no longer an enthusiastic participant, I dreaded the act so badly that it started to wear on Jasper as well. That was why when he decided to steal the money and make a run for it, I was on board. Dave was always saying that he would do anything for me. The original idea was that a few weeks after we stole the money, we'd use it to buy narcotics from a group of people Jasper had connections with in Mexico. After getting the narcotics, we would go our separate ways. Jasper would keep the money and I would be free of him without losing my husband. That took me back to giving Dave a chance to prove that he would in fact do anything for me. As soon as we got the money, Jasper would call in a ransom demand. Before Dave paid it, I would supposedly escape due to the help of some Mexican citizens who would of course be paid for their rescue. As we continued to plan, a lot of the details changed. One of those was the fact that we didn't want the FBI or any of the government agencies coming after Jasper. The FBI, the CIA, the NSA, RCMP, all of those alphabetic scumsucker had one thing in common. Sooner or later, they caught you. And they absolutely would not give up until they did. The FBI would be the least of his worries. They supposedly only operated inside of the US. They were also so busy investigating the president that they really didn't have time to do anything else. The CIA had him scared shitless though. They operated anywhere in the world and didn't tell anybody a goddamn thing about what they did. And where the FBI would be concerned with arresting him and bringing him to justice for a very public hearing, the CIA would just put a bullet up his butt and pretend they never found him. The NSA would use facial recognition to find him, a drone to kill him and claim that it had been done in the interest of national security. The RCMP had really lost their effectiveness when Dudley Do-Right had retired. And I knew Jasper, if his butt was on the line, he'd wrap me out in a second. The evidence of that was the fact that we had a lot of people helping us, and Jasper had promised all of them some of, most of, or all of the money after we doubled or tripled it by selling the narcotics. So, we came up with the idea of faking our deaths using what I'd been told were cadavers. I didn't find out until afterwards that they'd been alive and drugged. Another thing that had to be changed was the kind of narcotics we were buying. Originally, we'd been after weed, but the day after we stole the money, marijuana became legal in our state. We had to renegotiate with our Mexican friends for other narcotics. 
I planned to call Dave from Mexico to tell him that I was alive and on the run. We'd have to relocate to a different state. I was sure that Dave loved me enough to do that for me. Dave is a talented engineer. He could work almost anywhere in the world. I was sure he thought that I was worth it. And if I wasn't, Avery was. I have to admit that everything went smoothly for the first couple of days. When we got to Mexico, we found out that due to the changes in our order, it would take three of four days to get everything ready for us. We would also have to come up with a way to get it into the U.S. ourselves. We were advised to maintain a low profile and to try to avoid being seen as much as possible. So, we stayed in our hotel room with nothing to do except sex. Since it was going to be the last time, we were together, I didn't even mind. I just wanted it over. Three days and an extremely tiring later, we got the call. We'd be making the exchange the next afternoon. Jasper and I were both relieved. Until we got to the bank and discovered that Dave had basically locked us out of the account. I was sure that he hadn't discovered the money. He had probably locked all of his accounts down since he thought I was dead. It was just bad luck. Both Jasper and I were pissed. It was the first real snag in our plans, but it was a bad one. And if we thought we were angry, the narcotics lords made our anger seem like an irritated toddler. In my mind, it was like when you went to the store and your credit card was declined. Maybe you were a bit embarrassed. But in the end, the worst part was leaving the store without the things you wanted to buy. They saw it completely differently. They beat the cowboy shit out of Jasper on the spot. It's been almost three years since I've seen him. For the first few days, I was assaulted repeatedly. They seemed to be really impressed by the size. So except for having sex with men against my will, I wasn't harmed. I was so afraid after seeing what had happened with Jasper that I did any and everything I was told to do without any questions asked. So where did I end up? Where else? I was in a brothel owned by the narcotics lord. For the past three years, I've screwed every man who came into my room. I don't ask any questions. I don't cause any trouble. I just lay there and smile. Truthfully, my life really hasn't changed much. The biggest difference is that I'm doing it for nothing and I have no control over who I screw, but in a lot of ways, I really never did. My life with Dave seems like a long distant dream now. I can't believe I gave that life away for nothing. I wonder every day about Dave. I wish with all of my heart that I had some way of getting in contact with him. Dave would move heaven and earth to get me back. And I wondered about my daughter, but not too much. Dave would take care of her. Of that I had no doubts. She had probably turned into a spoiled little girl who had everything she wanted. My mom. I have no idea what happened to her. She was probably still smoking all the weed she could get her hands on and still willing to do anything she could to get it. I also worried about myself. I had no idea how long I could endure my current situation. I was barely fed, and what food I got wasn't good. There was also the issue of disease. I had no idea what happened to women who contracted an STD. Did they have doctors or medics on staff or on call? I doubted it. And the owner of the place, the narcotic lord who was the boss of the guys who brought me here, I'd only seen him once. It was the first night that I came here. He was the first man to sample me. He was a short, but stocky, very intense man with a very strange sense of humor. He referred everyone to his consulting firm for every problem. I once saw him send a customer out back to meet his consultants, the firm of Smith & Wesson. There was a booming sound from behind the building, but the customer never returned. I wondered then if that was his way of solving medical issues too. The man on top of me was done then he simply got up and walked out of the room. He did look around as if inspecting everything. It was almost as if he was looking for something he could steal. That would be stupid because Smith & Wesson handled theft and security issues too. After he left, I showered and sat back on the bed. I looked around the hallway and it was eerily quiet. I changed the sheets and laid down for a rare nap. Before sleep took me, I heard footsteps stomping through the place. I knew that security would take care of it in seconds, but strangely the stomping continued. And then I heard it. A very manic sounding voice. And the voice was screaming my name. The footsteps came closer and then the door slammed open and a strange looking man came into the room. Dana, it's me, he said. I looked at him through fear shaded eyes. He was a strange, scrawny white man, with a patch over one eye and tattoos that made no sense. Someone had tattooed bitch across his forehead and other equally strange things in either Spanish or English across his chest and arms. He stomped with a limp, favoring his right leg. I cowered behind the bed as he stared at me. Dana, it's me, he rasped. Are you one of my regulars? I asked. Truthfully, I spent most of my time in the dark, but there did seem to be something familiar about him. It's Jasper, you moron, he spat. Come on, we gotta get out of here while we can. Oh no, 
I yelled. Hell no. I have no intention of rocking the boat. They test us all the time. If we try to escape, they beat the hell out of us and sometimes they kill one or two as an example. The boss has a sadistic streak that's as plain as the bitch tattoo on your face. Dana, your boss is dead. A newer, meaner narcotic lord killed him and most of his goons about an hour ago. He killed him in the middle of the street. This one is even meaner. He has these attack dogs. His men shot your boss as part of a drug deal gone bad. Then they paraded him through the streets naked with a stake tied to his nuts. When they got to the center of town, he let those dogs loose on him. From what I've heard, it wasn't pretty. The news spread through town like lightning. Your old boss. I guess he was mine too. He ruled through fear. So, none his men were really loyal to him. Most of them took off when he was killed. There are a few that are still fighting the new guy's men. But most of them just think that maybe they could take over if they managed to kill this new guy. While you've had it easy up here, getting all the tool you want, I was forced to work in the narcotic labs and on the poppy plantation. I am getting the serious sex out of here. Are you with me or not? He had a rundown truck that he had stolen from the narcotic lab. It looked as though it was barely running. But when he started it, I could tell it had a powerful motor. It was used to transport product to his warehouses, he smirked. Occasionally they ran into an honest cop and had to hot foot it back into safe territory. It'll get us to the border, or close enough anyway. Eight hours later, we were in a cheap tourist motel in one of those nameless border towns. Jasper had sold the truck for a few hundred dollars and clothes for both of us. I thought it was a stupid idea until he told me that a lot of people all over Mexico knew that truck and who owned it. The guy who'd bought it from us owned a chop shop, so the truck was probably a collection of parts on a shelf somewhere. Jasper was also certain that getting across the border wouldn't be a problem if we walked. He also gotten some legitimate IDs that had been stolen from tourists. They were Americans and didn't look too drastically different from us. Jesus, Dana, what happened to you? He asked. You well, there's no easy way to say it. You look like hell. What the hell did they do to you? Nothing, I said. As long as I put out, I got fed and pretty much left alone. Well, honey, you didn't age well, he said. You always had good curves, but now you have a big belly to go with them. It makes no sense. The one thing you needed was some meat, or maybe just some fat on your body, and you'd have been off the charts hot. I figured with your belly getting bigger, your butt would too. But lying around all day must not be helping. It looks like the back of your legs swallowed up whatever little butt you had. It's almost like your lower back is trying to meet your front. And that beautiful smile you always had? Well, now your face is starting to look a lot like your mom's. Yeah. Well, you're not exactly George Clooney yourself, I spat. You look like one of those frat boys who fell asleep at a party and his friends used a marker to write shit all over his face. Only yours appear to be permanent. And what the hell is wrong with your leg? Hop along. Screw you, he spat. Never again. I hissed. Except for my husband, no man will ever take me in this lifetime. I'm done. Shit. I didn't mean it literally, he said. I saw that thing back at the brothel. And yeah, I'm busted up. I got that way by trying to escape. I didn't just lie down and do it. I fought. And every time I tried to escape, I got a tattoo or a broken bone. So, screw you Dana, at least I tried. And as soon as I got away, what the hell did I do? I came to get your 304 butt. And this is the thanks I get? You know the new guy is just gonna take over everything the old guy had, right? Think about it. If I hadn't come to get your stupid butt, you'd probably be screwing one of his about now. So. A little gratitude isn't out of the question. You're right, Jasper, I said. It's just, well, Jasper, I lost three years of my life. I lost three years with a guy who worshipped me. And shit, my kid. My kid is probably around 16 by now. My mother probably has her screwing everything in that trailer park. That's what she did to me. I mean, she didn't force me to start. But in my teen years, she just... I got a crush on a boy. My mom used to let me have him over and then go out. She left beer and weed where we could find it and when nature took its course, she busted us. There we were, right in the trailer's tiny living room, on that ratty sofa, pumping away. I don't think either of us knew what we were doing. He was in shock, and as oblivious as I was. I was in the process of opening my shirt when I noticed the look on his face. I also noticed that he wasn't exactly looking at me. He was looking past me at something over my shoulder. I turned around and saw my mother sitting there. How was it? She asked. He was still on the fence between talking and bolting for the door. Relax, she told him. You're not in any trouble. You're not doing anything that I haven't done myself. He relaxed. Yep. Yeah, I've seen quite a few tools in my time, she continued. That was all it took. He headed for the door, 
with my mother's laughter following him all the way. If I'd expected my mom to be upset, I was disappointed. She just smiled down at me and mumbled, it's about goddamn time. A few weeks later, I was introduced to her concept of helping out around the house. It always involved screwing some old guy, for money for food, or a reduction in rent or just something we needed. And I was pretty sure that back home, my mother would have my daughter following in our footsteps. A third generation of trailer park floozies. We have to go back, he said. Our backs are against the wall, Dana. I know that by now you hate me. I mean, I got us into this shit. But we're gonna have to work together to get out of it. We're like a football team where all of the star players hate each other. The quarterback hates the wide receiver, and the running back hates them both. But it's crunch time, and if we want to get into the playoffs, we have to work together, or the team goes nowhere. The way I see it, you're better off than I am. You at least have two possibilities. On one hand, I saw how much that dweeb loves you. Love like that is hard as hell to get over. So, it may be the case where you can slip into town, contact him, and have him help you out. Shit, he may even do what you think he's gonna do. He may agree to just leave town and start over again with you somewhere else. I mean you said he was some kind of highfalutin engineer, so he could get a job anywhere. In less time than it takes to tell about it, you and him could be set up somewhere across the country and maybe even get your kid back from your mom. You could have your whole happy little life back and never do anything this stupid again. Or option two, he takes one look at you and starts cursing at you. I mean it has been three years, Dana, and you ain't exactly the woman who left him. Shit. Maybe a few weeks of good food and some exercise can get you back to being just as hot as you were. But he might be so pissed at you that he's just done with you. In that case, you grab your mom and your brat and you three start over somewhere. Shit, there's a third possibility too. Maybe after all of the shit we've been through, the two of us just start over somewhere together. But at any rate, in any goddamn case, we need money to start over. And I know where we can get a hundred grand that belongs to us anyway. Now, we may be lucky. Your dumb husband may not even have noticed the money. I know it's doubtful, but it is possible. You have this way of putting feathers in a guy's head. The town cops might also still think we're dead. We're not exactly dealing with the cream of the crop in terms of law enforcement. So maybe we can sneak into town and ask your hubby for the money, nicely. If he wants you back, I get to keep it to start my life over. If he wants no part of you, we each get 50k and go our separate ways. But if he wants to keep the money, things may get shitty. We may have to kind of put some pressure on him, you know? So, I need you to figure out something that we can threaten him with or use to bargain with. That's easy, I said. If he gives us the money, I'll sign my kid over to him. That's stupid, he laughed. Why the hell would he go for that? He'd be stuck feeding her and dealing with all of her goddamned problems. I got three kids and I don't want any of him back. Shit, that will never work. It would never work with you, I said. You were born without a heart. But except for me, Dave loves my daughter and his car. And I'm beginning to think that Avery would be a lot better off away from me and my mother. Being with Dave would give her a much better shot at having a good life. So, we'll cross the border and make our way back home. Once we get there, we find my mom and get my kid. Then we trade her for the money. But if Dave still wants me, you take the money and go away. Yeah, but even with these fake IDs, getting across the border might not work, he said. It ain't like the old days. The government seems to have a serious issue with immigrants. Even though he slipped his wife's parents into the country, and neither one of them was a hot shot scientist or person the country needed. It's like he has two sets of rules, one for him and one for everybody else. Anyway, he has troops at the border and IC agents in the border patrol and from what I hear, those guys don't take any shit. So be prepared to turn and run if this shit goes sideways. Two hours later, shaking in our pants we approached the border. Maybe we should just turn around, I said. And do what? He spat. Stay in Mexico and start our own brothel? Sooner or later we're gonna have to go home Dana. We have to at least get back in the US. We don't belong here. We don't belong there anymore, either, I said. We stole money and pretended to be dead. We may end up in jail. I'm going, he said. And he walked off. If I don't make it, you can always find a bar to work out of. Maybe your next pimp won't be a sadistic sex. Oh wait, they're all like that. We along with a large group of people walked towards the towers flanking the large entrance to the U.S. Without realizing it, we had lucked out. There were probably 20 or 30 men there. Some of them had what looked like automatic weapons. But none of them seemed to give a shit. They were all pissed off. Jasper presented his ID and took a breath to start trying to explain his strange appearance. The border agent held up his hand. I ran to catch up to Jasper. Save it, buddy. I don't give a shit, said the border agent. Let me guess. 
You dragged your sorry butt down here on vacation, and while you were drunk out of your goddamn skull, some of your friends had those stupid tattoos put on you. Big deal. You're the third one this week. Welcome home. Next. Officer. I said slipping in beside Jasper. You left out the part where his dumb behavior is gonna get us divorced as soon as we get back to Michigan and... He held up that hand again. You knew what he was like when you married him, he spat. This can't be the first time he did something this goddamn dumb. I mean, look at him. Next. I'm sorry to pry, officer, I said. But you seem a tad upset. We all are, ma'am, he spat. Behind us, I heard him talking to his associates. Hey, you didn't even check her ID, said one of the agents. Didn't have to, he said. She was married to that dumbass with the bitch tattoo. I feel sorry for both of them. She married a drunken moron who's never gonna amount to anything. And he married a 50-year-old bleached blonde who looks like she's old enough to be his mother. She looks like one of those strippers that you meet when you're drunk and wake up the next morning to find out that she's damned near a hundred and still jumping out of cakes. Besides, didn't you hear them talk? They're straight from the Midwest, that Chicago or Detroit accent. And people from that area love to talk. I already know their goddamned life stories, sheesh. Do you think they'll really get divorced? Asked the other agent. Hell no. Spat the first guy. Haven't you seen that shit on Jerry Springer a hundred times? They're stuck with each other. Nobody else would want either one of them. I was so glad to be back in the US that I was almost giddy. We had a long road ahead of us, but we were home. I breathed a sigh of relief. One of our problems was gone. We no longer had to worry about Mexican narcotic lords on our butts. Things were easier than I thought. Americans are simply too trusting and far too goddamn nice. Jasper and I were able to hitch a ride to the nearest bus station. Once there, we used the last of the money we got from the sale of the truck to buy two bus tickets back to Michigan. A really stupid woman left her phone on the table in the bus station, so I stole it to teach her a lesson. I called my mother. Who the hell is this? She asked. Mom, it's me. Dana, I said. All right, you guys. Somebody get me some weed. I'm so drunk I thought I was talking to my dead damn daughter on the phone. She didn't even hang the phone up she just put it down. So I heard a bunch of laughter in the background. I didn't know they had cell service in hell. She screamed. I dropped the phone out the window of the bus. I couldn't keep it because those things were too easy to track. As soon as that stupid woman reported it stolen, they'd be on my butt. They do believe we're dead. I told Jasper. He nodded and went back to sleep. The next day, I called my mom from another stolen phone only to find her high as a kite again. Mom, put Avery on the phone, I said. She burst out laughing and put the phone down again. Hey guys, my dumb dead, damn daughter wants to talk to my ungrateful bitch of a granddaughter who deserted me. How the hell am I supposed to arrange that? Let me talk to her, slurred an obviously drunken guy. I heard the phone bumping and a bunch of noise but no words. And then my mother's voice again. I'm gonna bust your, but if you broke my phone, a hole, you can't fart into a phone. It's a cell phone, not a smell phone. You're so dumb you can't even spell phone. Yes, I can, said a pissed off guy. If I spell it right, you gotta give me BJ again. Phone. Damn it, said my mom. You always were a good speller. Then she shouted into the phone. Dana, wait a second. I'm gonna pull Avery out so you can talk to her. Not. I have no idea where she is. I haven't seen her in years. This ain't funny. Dead people ain't got no phones. Then the phone hit the floor and I heard nothing but sounds. I threw yet another phone out the window of the bus. I shook my head. My mother hadn't changed at all. She'd be no help to us. As badly as I wanted to steal another phone at our next stop and try to call Dave, I didn't dare to. There was always the possibility that if I called Dave, the police might be waiting for us as soon as we hit town. My mother was useless. Once she sobered up, if she ever did, she probably wouldn't remember that I had called. Hearing that my daughter had run away, started the tears. I'd counted on my mom to take care of her own goddamned grandchild, but clearly, she was too far gone for that. But maybe Avery was better off on her own. Things couldn't be much worse for her than living with my mother. Meanwhile, Dave. Shit, I thought as I pulled into my driveway. I wasn't the first one home. I pulled my blacked out 2014 Camaro in, very close behind the bright yellow 2018 Camaro that was already there. I laughed just seeing the car. That car had four-cylinder eco boost motor. Just thinking about it made me laugh. But I had to admit that it was a good car for Avery. It made about 300 horsepower, which was anemic to me but more than enough for a 16-year-old girl with a lead foot. The car was also a convertible, which sickened me even more. I'd gotten a sweetheart deal on the car for Avery's 16th birthday, and with her heading off to college in less than two years it was gonna be necessary. 
This way she'd have a couple of years of driving experience under her belt before she started. And Avery was already breaking my heart. I loved the fact that she was staying in-state and going to MSU. It was really the best of both worlds. State's campus in Lansing was 90 miles away from home. She could come home every weekend, or if she got sick or homesick, she could be back in her own bed in less than two hours. But I hated the fact that she was going to MSU. I'd have preferred my little girl to go to U of M for two reasons. The first was that it was where I'd gone. And the second, because an arbor was even closer to home. She could probably do the trip to an arbor in less than 40 minutes. I smelled a Christie in that decision since MSU was Christie's school. I smiled again. I loved my life. You absolutely never know what fate has in store for you. I felt like a rocket. That was a fitting description of my life. Rockets take off for space, and they sound powerful. They put out an awesome amount of thrust to get them off the ground and into the sky. But then free of the bounds of gravity, the large, heavy, rocket boosters are jettisoned and the second stage fires. The rocket then goes even higher and even faster after getting rid of all of the excess weight of the boosters. That was a perfect description of my life. Out of the blue, I was in my second stage of life. I had jettisoned the bullshit that had held me back and I was headed for orbit. Getting rid of that cheating, scallywag of a 304 that I'd married, had been the same as getting rid of the booster. In my second stage of life, there was no telling how fast, how high, or how far I could go. And one of the things that had made it better was the fact that I wasn't doing the journey alone. Avery and I were as close as we could possibly be. The fact that Dana had abandoned both of us had actually driven us even closer than we already were. It was so hard to imagine a woman who just walked out on the two people who loved her most. She left the man who'd loved her since the first time I set eyes on her and the daughter that had been pulled from her own womb for a con man and a bag of peanuts. I know that's an exaggeration, but it's pretty close to being true. They didn't even get the money. In fact, Avery had gotten more of the money than they did. The company's insurance carrier had given me a 5% finder's fee and I'd promptly put every nickel of it into Avery's college fund. And Christy, she jettisoned some demons of her own. Now that had been incredible. The Christy of today was very different. Getting together had taken a lot of time, a lot of effort and a lot of forgiving on both of our parts. The thing that had made the biggest difference though was the fact that we had just clicked almost from the start. But even after our talk and realizing that we wanted to be together, it took a lot of work. First off, there was the issue of touch. It took weeks before Christy allowed me to touch her. It was funny because I'd thought that we were past that battle. Even before we got together, Christy had a habit of holding my hand and hugging me and whenever she got excited, she would peel off one of those kisses of hers that to this day leave me tingling. What I didn't realize was that Christy had been the initiator in all of those things. For me to suddenly touch her, whether it was reaching for her hand or just giving her a gentle hug was completely different. I didn't understand it at first. We had a lot of hurt feelings and broke up a few times over it. I ended up having to see Christy's therapist. She explained it all to me. It wasn't that Christy didn't love me or that she didn't want to feel comfortable with me touching her. The problem is that the things Christy had been through, like a lot of sex crimes weren't about sex. It was about intimidation and power. So, Christy had to learn that if I hugged her, or reached out to hold her hand, I wasn't trying to intimidate her or take her power away. I was only trying to show her that she was special to me and that I loved her. We got a lot of mileage out of that. Her therapist gave us an assignment that really helped with that. She had me give Christy massages. That got us much farther than we ever expected. That took us to the point where I could not only touch Christy whenever I wanted, but to the point where she liked having me touch her. It was about that time that our kisses started to heat up. I knew that we were getting help from some other sources, the first night that Christy opened her mouth as we kissed. Again, it was months before things went any further. And they went further because I screwed up. And it happened so quickly that I never saw it coming. One evening, Christy had to work late. She came in through the door and told me that somebody had better get ready to do some massaging because she'd been dreaming about it all day. I got up and went over to kiss her. Christy is a lot shorter than I am, and her kisses make me stupid sometimes. We stood there in the living room, with our arms wrapped around each other, sucking the life out of each other. She actually moaned, and it drove me crazy. I ran my hands down her sides and without thinking about it, I grabbed Christy and just pulled her even more into me. Christy's curves and legs, beside her smile and that incredible hair are her best physical features. Before I even realized it, she was pushing me away from her. Why am I so stupid? She hissed. You just want to assault me too. The only difference is that you want to get inside of my guard before you screw me. It's not gonna work, a hole. And she took off. 
Over an hour later, Marjorie called me. Dave, what's going on? She asked. I explained it all to her, and she didn't understand it either. I've seen the two of you making out like teenagers, she said. It was the worst time I ever remember. It took over a week before we got together again, and that in itself was an event. I'd been miserable the whole time. Marjorie had called me daily, several times some days. Dave, she's going out of her mind, she said. She threatened to shoot an old lady for jaywalking. What? I said. The old lady was crossing the street as Christy and Patrick drove by, said Marjorie. There were no cars passing. But Christy saw the old lady holding her husband's hand and something snapped. I think she misses you, Dave. That old woman holding her husband's hand made my daughter so jealous that she flipped out. She went over and before Pat could calm her down, whipped out her ticket book and started writing. She was pissed. And the old lady. You know how old women are. She balled up the ticket and threw it on the ground. Christy pulled out her gun and told the old woman to get down on the ground. The woman couldn't. Her arthritis is so bad that she can barely bend her knees. Luckily Patrick was there. Dave, you have to do something? Marjorie, I'll call her again tomorrow, I said. And I'll keep trying but she never talks to me. She just hangs up when she hears my voice. Yeah, and then cries for hours afterwards, she said. Did you know that she's stalking you? It was after midnight when I noticed her. I was sound asleep and felt a body near me. At first, I thought it was Avery and maybe she was having a bad dream. When my eyes were fully open, I realized that it was Christy. I went into shock. Christy had never actually been in my bed. We'd fallen asleep on the sofa or on the deck a few times, but this was different. She pulled the covers off of herself and my shock deepened. Christy was totally naked. Her body was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. I knew I had to be very careful in how I handled it. I pulled the blankets back over her as gently as I could. She kicked them back off angrily. That was when I noticed her tears. It's okay, Davy. She said as if every word was torn from the bottom of her soul. You won. You can screw me. Please don't hurt me. I can't take this pain anymore. Christy, I would never hurt you for any reason. I, Christy, I love you. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. I don't know what pain you're talking about. Being away from you, Davy, she cried. I can't do it anymore. So just go ahead and screw me. I kissed her very gently on her forehead, pulled the covers back over her, and told her to go to sleep. I can stay? She asked. Of course, I said. Just like that? She asked. Yep, I said. The next morning, I awoke to find Christy spooned against me. I quickly unwrapped my arms and moved away from her naked body. I've been awake for a while, she said calmly. Honey, I'm really sorry, I said. Davy, I need to know something, she said. Were you telling me the truth last night or just trying to calm me down? Huh, I asked. You told me that you loved me, she said. You said you want to spend the rest of your life with me. Yep, I said that, I told her. We really hit the therapy after that. We had tons of things to work out. One of them was good for a lot of people. Our therapist told Christy that she had to move out of her apartment. Christy really hadn't been staying there. Unless we were arguing, she stayed with Avery and me. But the therapist thought that Christy needed to fully commit. It would be better for both of us if she had to stay and work things out when we argued. So, Amanda took over Christy's apartment and Christy moved in with us. Theoretically, she had her own room, but she slept with me. I was the happiest man on earth. Waking up with my arms full of Christy and that body pressed against me was the best thing in the world. All I had to do was think about it and I was happy. And every time I saw Christy, I smiled. Marjorie loved rubbing it in. So, Dave, she said to me, one morning when she and Amanda had stopped by so all of the girls could go shopping. You wanted to talk to me about something? I need a really big favor, Marjorie, I said. Dave, all you have to do is ask, she said. She doesn't know I'm asking you this. I said, but I'd like you to give Christy her driver's license back. I thought she was going to spit her coffee all over me. Marjorie, Christy loved her dad, I said, and he drove like a bat out of hell. A lot of times when he'd pick Christy up from school, he'd get a call and have to go save someone's life. Christy got used to that. It was kind of their thing together. So, for a while, driving like that was all Christy had when she wanted to feel close to him. She's better now. We talk about her dad all the time, and she cares more now. She has people in her life, and she sees things differently. I promise you she'll drive safely. I should have known that it wasn't something for you. Dave, she smiled. I'll give it some thought. Well, can you think about it before next Friday? I asked. Why, wait. Next Friday is her birthday, she smiled. I kind of, um, got her a car, I said. It's almost as cool as mine. Marjorie looked shocked. 
David, you do seem to enjoy giving me heart attacks, she said. Isn't that kind of expensive for a birthday present? I don't think so, I said. Marjorie, you do know that I'm eventually going to marry your daughter, right? She almost spat out her coffee again. Shit, Dave. Stop doing that, she laughed. But, I mean you guys aren't even having s. She paused and looked at me. You love her that much? Okay, I'll do it, but on two conditions. One, you have to make sure that she drives very damned safely. And two, you have to answer a question for me. Sure, I said. As you know, Dave, I'm a trained investigator. A few minutes ago, I had to go to the bathroom. I needed to pee really badly. Christy told me to use the bathroom in her bedroom. So, I did. I noticed, being a trained investigator, that her bathroom and her bedroom are kind of dusty. When I turned the taps on to run the water, the pipes banged. Apparently, that bathroom and amazingly Christy's bed doesn't get much use. So where exactly is my daughter sleeping, Dave? I wee. Oh boy. I stammered. Gotcha. She smirked. Now you know how that feels. A few weeks after Christy's birthday, it happened. She'd become more and more comfortable wrapping those silken, sculptured legs around me. It was about 1 a.m. when she woke me up. Davy, I had a dream about us, she said. When somebody you don't know or don't like tries to kiss you, it's not good. When your old crazy uncle tries to kiss you, it's unpleasant, but not exactly scary or bad. When somebody who loves you kisses you, it's awesome. By that time, she'd kicked one of those legs across my waist and was on top of me. And she started kissing me like only Christy could. Once we'd gotten into it, I got scared. I had no idea what to do. On a normal woman, yeah, but with Christy, it was like tap dancing in a minefield. One bad move, and it's all over. Davy, are you nervous? She asked. I nodded my head in the darkness. Her musical laugh did nothing to make me relax. Honey, you're fine. There are only the two of us in this room, she said. Her voice was languid and lilting at the same time. She reached down and took both of my hands. As gently as I could, I rolled her off of me. She took a very deep breath, burst into tears and screamed, Screw you, Davy, at the top of her lungs. I reached for her, and she slipped past me. She grabbed a robe and ran down the stairs. A few seconds later I heard the sound of her Camaro starting, and then she roared off into the night. I picked up the phone. Marjorie. Sorry to wake you. Christy. She took off and. Dave, you sound awful, she said. Tell me. Hang on. I have another call. A few seconds later she was back. Dave, it's her. She's on her way over here. I'll call Amanda and have her go to your house to stay with Avery. You come on over here. I'll play referee. I went up and told Avery that I was going to Marjorie's and it was important. I told her that Amanda was coming over to stay with her, and as sleepy as she was, she asked me why. Dad, I'm 15, she said. I babysit, remember? Yeah, but you're my baby and I worry when you're alone, I said. And remember, we still don't know where. She'd be crazy to come back here, Dad, she said. I hugged her just as Amanda came in. After they said hi to each other and Amanda, who was dressed for bed got in beside Avery my daughter asked the question I was trying to avoid. So, Amanda, how did you get roped into this? She asked as she fluffed her pillow. Your parents are arguing and they need Marjorie to help them work through it, yawned Amanda. Moments later, I arrived at Marjorie's. I parked behind Christie's Camaro, in front of the house, because Marjorie's driveway was tiny. I grabbed the bag I'd brought with me and headed for the porch. Once inside, I found Marjorie trying to comfort her emotional daughter. Sweetie, can we talk about this? I asked. No, she said loudly. You're an idiot. Get out of my house. You know, Dave, this is why I always say no when you ask me to marry you. Okay, we need some rules here, said Marjorie. But first, he asked you to marry him? He asks me all the time, harumphed Christy. Marjorie rolled her eyes. Christy Elizabeth Callahan, are you crazy? Asked Marjorie. Forget it. First thing is that the two of you will each have an opportunity to tell your side. Second thing is that this isn't your house, Christy. You live two miles that way, with Dave and Avery. You are not sleeping here, so don't get too comfortable. Now who goes first? Me, said Christy. Well, before you start, I brought you some stuff, I said, just to get you comfortable, okay? Christy had her arms folded across her chest. What did you bring me? She asked. I reached into the bag and brought out a pair of innerwear and handed them to her. Then I gave her a pair of her infamous yoga pants and one of my t-shirts. I do have my own shirts, she grumbled. Yeah, but you never wear them, I said cautiously. I thought that if I brought one of your shirts, you'd think I didn't want you to wear mine. 
I pulled the furry slippers I'd bought her out of the bag, then. Christy. Marjorie shrieked, as she realized what was going on. You left the house naked under that robe? I was upset, said Christy. It's his fault. She started to pull on her clothes and Marjorie told her to do it in the bathroom. I'll make some more coffee, shrugged Marjorie. Christy screwed up her face. You don't like coffee all of a sudden? Asked Marjorie. Not at night, Mom, said Christy. I can't go to sleep after drinking it. At night I like. She paused as I brought out a packet of raspberry cocoa. Christy went to change while Marjorie and I went into the kitchen. And something struck me then. Marjorie had probably been drinking coffee herself as she did her paperwork. But there were two cups on her coffee table, not one. David, what did you do to my daughter? She asked, causing me to forget what I was thinking about. What do you mean? I asked. She's different, said Marjorie. She's kind of. Before she could finish her statement, Christy called out from the living room. Marjorie and I had coffee, Christy had her cocoa. At home I get, she pouted. I held up a bag. Marshmallows, I said. Marjorie looked at me, and then at Christy. Did you bring me any? Christy began. I handed her two cookies, wrapped in aluminum foil. Marjorie rolled her eyes. Christy broke off a very small piece of one of the cookies and gave it to Marjorie. That's really good, said Marjorie. Where did you? We made him, said Christy. We have these couch movie nights with just the three of us, and she stopped talking in mid-sentence. She looked over at me. I'm still pissed at you, she said. Why don't you tell us why? While you sip your chocolate and eat your cookies, said Marjorie. Davy doesn't know how to accept a gift, said Christy. Maybe he's so busy giving them, began Marjorie. Sorry. So, I've been feeling pretty weird lately, said Christy. It's hard to describe. I mean, I know Davy loves me. And Mom, I love him too. But lately, I've just had trouble keeping my hands off him. And both of you know my history, and Davy hasn't put any kind of pressure on me at all. But tonight, I just realized that it was time. You know. So, I gave him all of the signals. Mom, I did stuff that let him know exactly what I wanted. And St. Dave rolled me off of him and got out of bed. I felt so rejected that I just got angry. And I started thinking, maybe Dave doesn't really want me. Maybe he's really not over that murderous, bleached blonde, $2.304 he married, and I'm just a convenient way to fight off missing her without having to cheat on her. A tear rolled down her cheek. I know I'm kind of damaged and I act really weird sometimes, but I thought, I was sure that Davey loved me, faults and all. So, there I was, offering him myself on a silver platter, and he just didn't want it. Then her tears really began to fall. And before I knew it, I crossed the distance that separated us and she was in my arms sobbing. Christy, nothing could be farther from the truth. Honey, I'm just scared, I told her. Scared of what, Davy? She said angrily. She twisted herself around so she could see my face. But somehow, she never let go of me. The only person I have to compare you to is a crazy, assaulter who's dead. And I'm pretty sure you're gonna be better than him. Especially since I'm not only willing but aching to do it with you. Christy, I'm not trying to compete with anyone, I told her. This just isn't something that we can take lightly. I mean, oh, you don't even, I don't what? She asked. Wait, is it my turn yet? I asked. She slapped me on the shoulder. We're not taking turns, dummy, she said. We're talking. I turned to look at Marjorie and noticed that she had put on her reading glasses and was taking sips of Christie's cocoa as she munched on the second cookie. She was actually reading some sort of document. She suddenly looked towards us. You're doing fine, she said. Go on. Okay, I said nervously. Christy, I'm pretty sure I know when the worst few days of your life were. Marjorie looked up when I said that. And it wasn't the couple of days with that psycho, like most people would think, I said. It was when you lost your dad, right? She squeezed my hand. Do you know when mine was? I asked. When we brought you in to identify your wife's remains? She asked. I shook my head. Wait, she said. It was when that crazy old woman was trying to get custody of Avery, right? Nope. I knew all along that Linda only wanted money. If I had to, I'd have just paid her. She looked puzzled. And even Marjorie put down her papers. It was a few months ago, I said. You jumped on me and kissed me. It was the best kiss I'd ever had in my life. You pulled me tightly against you. I was getting worked up and my hands rubbed your back. Christy, you sighed and moaned but you didn't stop kissing me. My hands reached down and touched your back. And then like lightning it was all over. You pushed me away from you so fast and so hard that I went into shock. You started screaming at me. Christy, you compared me to... Davy. I remember. She said sadly. I went through it too. I hurt so badly after it was over. 
I have no idea why I even said those things. I told you Davy, I'm a work in progress. So how did you expect me to react when my hands touched your back again? I asked. Christy, I can't be away from you. Like that? It hurts. Davy, I put your hands on my back, this time, she said. I wanted them there. I'm ready for this. It just took us longer than usual to get here, but we're here now. Davy, I see it, now. I see both of us. I see you look at me from across a room and just light up. I see the way you get that dumb smile when I look back at you. But there's more to it. You keep awesome records, Davy. You leave your banking app open all the friggin' time. I saw how you used to have a budget for modifications on your Camaro. And then you suddenly stopped. There was a part of your earnings that went into savings, another part that went for Avery's college, and some for living expenses. Then suddenly, you stopped modding your car, and that money went somewhere else. Where did it go, Davy? Before I could answer, she told me. You put it all on buying my car, didn't you? It's like telling everyone that you see me as being more important to you than you yourself are. Davy, saying that I love you. Well, it just isn't enough. I feel like I want to be a part of you. I want you to be a part of me. I want us to be together forever, and a week after forever ends. I want us to still be racing our cars around the nursing home. I want Avery's kids and maybe, maybe our other kids, maybe someday, you know, to come and visit us so there will be tiny versions of us with some of our features and quirks running all over the PL. And the next thing I knew we were wrapped around each other and kissing. Out of the corner of my eye, I caught a glimpse of a smile on Marjorie's face. Then she started screaming at us. Okay, I've solved your problem. You guys are fixed. You can finish whatever you're doing in your own house. She yelled. So Christy and I went home. And we talked. We talked about a lot of things. We talked about why she was suddenly so ready to do something that she'd never wanted to do. It's not the same thing Davy. she told me. What I want to do with you is completely different from what was done to me. Maybe it's the same act but the motivation and the feelings are a lot different. It's like running. When you go out and run every night, it's a pleasurable thing to you. When I see you running you have a smile on your face. You enjoy it. There are other people who run because they have to do it to lose weight. They don't smile, most of them don't enjoy it and they're glad when it's over. And finally, there are people who are running because they're being chased. They could be chased by a dog, another person who wants to hurt them, or maybe they're running as fast as they can to get someplace safe, or to save themselves or someone else being hurt. They're not even thinking about running. They're thinking about their or someone else's safety, but they're still running. What we're gonna do isn't about giving pleasure to some freak. It's about expressing how we feel about each other and our need to be closer to each other. I need this. Haven't you ever thought about it? Well, I guess I always thought that our first time together would be beautiful and romantic. Like, maybe we'd be on vacation or on a cruise and we'd have candles in a beautiful setting and... And Davy, you've seen too many Hallmark movies, she laughed. If we wait for all of that crap, we'll never do it. What could be more romantic than the two of us lying next to each other in our warm, comfortable bed? I just want everything to be perfect for you, I said. Maybe we can take a couple of days off work and go somewhere. I want this to be a pleasant memory for you. Okay? Davy, it's us. She smiled. I love you. You love me. Nobody's first time is perfect. We'll have a lot of time to practice though. But if it makes you happy, I can probably get some vacation time and we'll plan a romantic getaway. Now you're talking. I smiled. Now in my mind, we'd agreed to take our time and wait to go someplace special. Christy saw it differently. Because less than an hour later, I woke up. My mind was still fuzzy from sleep. Christy was straddled on top of me again. I had no idea how she managed to get on top of me without waking me but she was there. I'm glad you're awake, she said. I wanted you conscious for this. Conscious for what? Her lips gently met mine and our tongues melted together. We made love with all our conscious. Love you Davy. she breathed into my mouth. And I felt it. I felt it as the passion built in both of us. Christy are you trying to kill me? I asked. Shut up. She said. Davy, that was awesome. I feel so good. I feel like I'm tingling all over. You liar. What did I lie about now? I asked. You told me that sex was only a tiny part of a relationship, she said. It's a lot bigger than I knew. I feel like I love you twice as much now. And over the next few months, that second stage really accelerated. The rocket that we called our life soared through the cosmos faster and faster. And I'm not sure that Christy noticed it, but I felt a bit of tension. It just seemed like everyone around us, but mostly Patrick, Amanda and Marjorie were waiting on something. I was also pretty sure that I knew what it was. They were expecting us to get married, or at least engaged, and for some reason, it was very important to them. I had no idea why. And if I mentioned it, Amanda just shook her pretty head and wouldn't talk about it. 
Patrick held up his hands in surrender, as if he had no idea what I was talking about and Marjorie smiled her way out of it. But there was something there. There had to be a reason for all of those nearly daily. So how are things going questions? Little did any of us know that the second stage was nearing a possible catastrophic correction. And that afternoon, as I pulled into my driveway behind Avery's Camaro, I was excited, but also slightly disappointed. The excitement came from the fact that it was a Wednesday. Wednesdays were our family movie nights. The rule was that whoever got home first got to pick the movie. Avery beating me home meant that I'd be subjected to whatever torturous teen girl flick she had in mind. On the other hand, I had some leverage because by being second, I got to pick the food. I went into the house and got on my treadmill for my run. I wanted to be done by the time Christy got home. I was a tiny bit worried about her. She hadn't quite been herself recently. I wondered if she was coming down with something. Marjorie, the voice of reason, reminded me that the anniversary of her husband's death was coming up and that Christy always got a little bit out of sorts then. An hour later, I got off of the treadmill and out of the shower to find Avery going through the movie channels with a devious look on her face. I snuck up behind her and grabbed her in a hug. Dad, you scared the crap out of me, she squealed. Christy's up. She began just as the doorbell rang. I went to the door and pulled it open and got the biggest shock of my life. Hi, honey, she smiled. Did you miss me? We have a lot to talk about and... She stopped talking and looked at me. You knew? She said. That really isn't good. How the hell did you know that I was still alive? And Jesus, Dave, what have you done to my baby? She looks like some spoiled little rich girl. I stopped by my mom's house and after she got over her shock that I was alive, she started whining about how you took Avery away from her and she got nothing out of it. My mind whirled. I needed to figure out how much she knew about everything and more than that, exactly what the hell she wanted. Mom said that Avery acted like she was an axe murderess instead of a blood relative and, getting over her shock, Avery went off. That's because all that woman has ever done is take stuff from me, said Avery. When you guys went on your little getaways and dad gave me money, she stole it. And any time I got something she thought she could use, she took it. What kind of dummy would I have to be to let her get her hands on my stuff? On my birthday three months ago, daddy gave me my car. For some reason, he just had to invite her to my party. The first thing she did was start asking me questions about my car. Then she asked me to take her for a ride after the party. She made a bunch of phone calls and I just felt weird about it. So, I told her I couldn't take her for a ride or even take her home. She's weird. So why are you looking at me like that? Asked Dana. I'm your mother. Wait a minute. You knew too. Is my mother the only person around here who didn't know that I was alive? So, Dave, we have a problem or two to discuss, she said. She came fully inside of the door finally, but left it open a bit. It was almost as if she needed or anticipated needing a quick escape route. I had no intention of trying to stop her. Dave, you always told me that you'd do anything for me, right? She said. Well, you've got a big choice to make. A couple of them, actually. But let's hit the big ones first. If you want us to be together, I mean, you clearly do. I mean, you're still taking care of my kid for God's sake. But anyway, if you want us together again, honey, it can't be here. We have to move somewhere else. I know that I have a lot to explain. And I know we're going to have some things that we need to get past. But if you really love me as much as you claim, I think it's possible. And Dave, let me tell you that while I was gone, it was thoughts of you and how much you love me that got me through. I'm absolutely done with that bullshit. I'm ready to settle down and be a good wife and mother and Yule. Okay, good luck with that. I said, keep me posted and... So, I guess that means you're pissed at me, she said quietly. Nope, it means we're done, I said. As in there's no chance. Ever. Okay, so I'll just take my kid and... She began. I'm not going anywhere, spat Avery. Not a chance of that. I spat. I crossed the room and got in front of Avery. So, you're gonna just take my kid? She said calmly. The court gave me custody when you abandoned us, I said. Relax, Dave, she said. I can see that things are really great between the two of you. If I didn't know you as well as I do, I'd almost think that there was something nasty going on here. You're disgusting, said Avery. I'm still your mother, little girl, said Dana, angrily. I don't know what fantasy world Dave has you thinking you live in, but I was doing far worse when I was even younger than you are. And you're wondering why I'm with my dad instead of being with your mom? Asked Avery, what kind of mother, what kind of person, would want their child to be living with someone whose lack of morals and compassion had led to them exposing their own child to abuse? Is this some kind of, she did it to me, so you can take it too, scenario? If you were any kind of mother, you'd want me to have the best life possible. You're fired. 
I'm what? Dana sputtered. Avery, get up to your room. Dave and I can talk. Daddy? Pouted Avery. It makes sense, I said. Honey, go upstairs and call Marjorie about your homework. Okay. But Marjorie? Okay, said Avery, figuring it out. I knew that if she called Marjorie, she'd let her know that Dana had resurfaced. I didn't feel threatened by Dana, but who knew what she might do? And then it all went to hell. As if it had been the plan all along, Dana stepped away from the door and Jasper stepped inside. He had a lot of ridiculous tattoos all over his face, neck and body, and just looked rough. He and Dana both looked like they'd been dragged through hell, twice. I told you, it wouldn't work, he said. Hey kid, stay where you are. Don't go up the stairs. You don't get to tell my daughter what to do, I said angrily. I was already moving towards him. This time was gonna make last times, but whipping seemed like a love tap. Dana, we need to wrap this up quickly and get the hell out of here, he said. Your way failed. The guy is over you. And while you were bullshitting around with your mom, who's so stoned that she doesn't know a thing about shit that happens on her own front porch, my baby's mama told me some very interesting things. Like the fact that Marjorie is the DA. And the fact that your hubby here is so tight with her that he drops in on her several times a week. So, telling your kid to call her, meant turning our butts into the cops. My ex saw them together more than once and they were pretty goddamn friendly. And apparently, he got her to sick the CPS worker on your mom to get custody of your kid. He looked at me then and as pissed as I was, he was calmly ducking behind the furniture. Or so I thought. Dave, if you're that into taking care of other people's kids, you can have mine. My ex is about to lose custody of them and truthfully, she's ready to give them up. According to her, she was ready to make a run at you herself. But Marjorie claimed that you were both a part of the investigation into what Dana and I did. So they wanted the two of you apart. I guess we know why now. Huh? Just as I got to him. Just as I was about to grab him. He calmly brought his hand up and in it was the biggest handgun I had ever seen. I felt like one of those guys who ran into Clint Eastwood and had to listen to him giving them that speech about how, this is a .44 Magnum, punk. The most powerful handgun in the world. I can blow your head clean off. The gun looked huge. I stopped immediately. Looking down the barrel of that thing was enough to ruin your shorts. Not gonna be like last time, Hoss, he smiled. One but beating in a lifetime is enough for me. It wasn't just you. Those Mexican junkies had a way of getting their point across too. Now we can all walk. Okay, maybe limp away from this, he said. This can be over in under an hour. It's four o'clock. The banks close at five. I've given this a lot of thought. Dana, shoot your kid. I turned around faster than I thought possible and ran across the room. Unbelievably, Dana pulled out a small gun. Here's how this works, explained Jasper calmly. You and I will head over to the bank. We'll withdraw my money and come straight back here. Then Dana and I will hot-foot it out of town. No fuss, no muss. Okay? And why the hell would I want to do that? I asked. Besides, I found your money, which is really the company you used to work for Smoney. Soon after you left, I turned it in. You're lying. He spat. Nobody would do that. I did, I said. You have to have a decent amount of money in the bank. He hissed. We'll take that. You're going to come to the bank with me and withdraw every cent you can get your hands on and then, why would I do that? I asked because you're gonna want to get back here as soon as possible, so you can take Dana's kid to the hospital. If it takes too long for us to get back, she may bleed out. Nope, I said. She won't bleed out because to shoot her you're gonna have to kill me. I pushed my way between Avery and Dana. We can't do that, hissed Dana. We need you to get the money. Then you need to come up with a different plan, I said, because there's no way in hell that I'm gonna let you hurt her. Dave, goddammit. She screamed. Do you think I'd ever hurt her? I don't want to do this either. I'm not getting any pleasure out of this. But we need that money. You clearly don't want me back. This was plan B. Plan A was for us to just run away together and be a family again. We'd just give Jasper the money so he could start a new life somewhere. That was the one I wanted. But you seem to be over me and my own daughter is standing there looking at me like she's disgusted by me. We don't have another choice. She dropped her voice. Dave, this is about survival for us, she said. We can't stay here. We can't go back to Mexico. We have to go somewhere, and we need money to do it. I promise you she won't be permanently hurt. I'm just going to barely graze her leg. I'll even let her pick which one. This is absolutely necessary. Dave, you're too goddamn smart, and too friendly with the cops. Plus, there's the fact that you always try to do the right thing. We can't trust that you won't try to somehow signal the cops. We need a head start. And if we shoot Avery, you love her Dave, and better than anyone else, I know how you are about people you love. If Avery needs it, you'll get us that money. I'll stay here with her to make sure she's okay, 
but also to make sure that she doesn't call the cops either. Besides, this is probably the last time I'll ever see my daughter. Then as soon as you and Jasper come back, we're out of here. You can run Avery right over to the hospital and one of those two Camaros out there. Shit, you can call the cops from the emergency room. All we're looking for is a head start. Three, said Jasper. She looked at him in confusion. There's three Camaros out there. You missed the one in the backyard near the garage. That one is red. He was describing Christie's car. Avery and I looked at each other. She nodded her head slightly and flashed her eyes upwards. I got it immediately. She was indicating that Christy was upstairs. Whatever, said Dana. It doesn't matter how many cars he has. We can't drive any of them. Those cars are too noticeable. They'd be too easy to track. And come on, let's get this started. The sooner we're out of here, the better. Why the hell are you so eager to shoot your own daughter? I asked. Dave, I promise she won't be permanently hurt, she said. Let's just get it over with. She raised her gun and I jumped in front of her. Look a hole, spat Jasper. Either we shoot the kid with that pop gun Dana has, or I shoot her. Jasper, you're not shooting her, said Dana. If you shoot her, we'd have a murder charge against us. I'll do it. She raised her gun and again I jumped between Avery and the gun. She tried to angle around me and I kept my body between Avery and the gun. Finally, Jasper grabbed my arm to give Dana her chance. And Dana went for it. She raised the gun and I heard the sound of gunfire. Dana got a shocked look on her face and I noticed two small red spots on her shirt. Jasper caught on a fraction of a second before I did. He raised his gun to shoot Christy, who just shot Dana and I dove for him, just as his gun went off. My flying body deflected his arm, but I felt like someone had slammed a baseball bat into my side. I landed on Jasper and knocked the gun out of his hand, but I had no strength to do anything else. There was blood all over my shirt, and it hurt just to breathe. He was wiggling under me trying to get free, but there was nothing I could do. I tried my hardest, but the strength was just leaking out of me. All I could do was use the weight of my body to prevent him from grabbing his gun. It was less than two feet away from us. And then, he stopped moving, very suddenly and went still. His last words, at least the last I heard from him, were, Holy shit! No wonder he got over you so easily. Look at the legs and the butt on that. As the light grew dim, Christy had stuck the barrel of her gun in his mouth to shut him up. You're dead. She told him in the coldest voice I'd ever heard. Then the door opened and there were a lot of feet running around my living room. Mom? He? Shot him. I heard Christy screaming. He? He? Was trying to shoot me and Davy jumped in front of him? I have no idea how much time passed while I was out of it. All I know is that I awoke in pain. Christy was on my left side, with her head on my bed, snoring loudly. Avery was next to me on the right, but she was in a chair with her feet up. Every time I breathed, I was in agony. I felt as if someone had stuffed cotton balls dipped in alcohol in my mouth and down my throat. Can somebody shut that chainsaw off? I asked. Someone stood up and came across the room. It was Marjorie. She tapped Christy to wake her and the snoring sound stopped. Marjorie leaned over and kissed me on my forehead. Mom, stop that, yelled Christy. It was just a thank you kiss, Christy. Jesus, said Marjorie. You can't go around confusing him, spat Christy. I'm gonna beat his butt in. Christy looked around and then her eyes narrowed, and she looked at me, and then back at Marjorie. Mom, what are you thanking him for? She asked. Christy, you're my daughter. I love you. Lots of men say they love you. But, Christy, Dave jumped in front of a gun for you. Marjorie said. That's why I wanted to. And that's why as soon as he's on his feet again, I'm gonna beat his butt, said Christy. Mom, I don't know what I'd have done. If, if and then she burst out crying and flung herself at me. Unfortunately, she landed on the side with the bullet wound. My scream of pain brought all of the nurses running. Davy, what's wrong? Asked Christy. Um, the most beautiful woman in the entire universe just plopped herself down on the side with the bullet holes in it, I groaned. I did not. I can't even reach you from here, said Avery waking up. Everyone in the room laughed. Hey, I have an idea, said Amanda who was just arriving. Since we're all here anyway, Christy could tell us why she'd summoned us to her and Dave's house the night that all of the excitement happened. Nuss said Christy, I'm gonna wait until all of this crap is over with, one problem at a time. Over the next few days, I recuperated. That big bullet had snapped two of my ribs and nicked my left lung. The missing pieces of the ribs were mended using pieces of carbon fiber. I lost a small amount of lung tissue that a few months of my regular runs would help with. All in all, I'd been lucky. Christy, Spent her days, with me. 
She showed up first thing in the morning and never left until long after visiting hours were over. I could tell she missed me. A couple of times she crawled into the hospital bed with me and fell asleep. And both of those times it was Avery coming to find her, not the hospital staff, that led to her going home. After the second incident, my doctor decided that I was healthy enough to recover at home, provided that I stayed in bed and came in once a week for checkups. Things were well until Dana woke up. Both she and Jasper started blaming everything on each other. Dana was asking for meetings with either me, or Avery, or both together. Avery refused to see her. I was going to do the same, but Marjorie convinced me that Dana might say something useful while we talked. Talked wasn't really the word for it. Christy had done a number on Dana. Her two snapped-off shots had been nearly fatal. One had hit Dana in the shoulder, and the other squarely in the chest, only inches from her heart. Or at least where the heart would be located on a normal woman. Despite what Marjorie had thought, our talk was not productive. Dana was angry and vindictive. She could only whisper a few words at a time before gulping at her oxygen supply. Dave, who the hell did you have in my house? She whispered angrily. Who was that awful little bitch that shot me? I wasn't aware that you had a house, I said calmly. Your name isn't on the mortgage. I've been figuring things out while I've been awake. And the picture isn't pretty, she muttered. You were so desperate after I left that you took up with one of Avery's friends, didn't you? She smirked. You should be ashamed of yourself. She gulped heavily on her oxygen and then started up again. She's a child, David. She does have nice legs and a great body. But, she took another pull on her oxygen. She's not really your type, Dave. She doesn't have much up top. Dana, she's exactly my type, I spat. And she has more up top than you do. Your chest is empty. Hers has a huge heart in it. She gulped away at her oxygen and just glared at me. You spent years telling me every goddamn day how much you loved me. And I stupidly believed you, Dana. Meanwhile, you were out there screwing every loser you could find, behind my back. Christy is so different from you, Dana. She doesn't even have to say the words. I can feel her love from across a room. Dave, I can do better, she wheezed. I can do much better. You just have to give me a chance. But first you need to get me a better lawyer. The guy I have now thinks he can get me off with only five years. But with me getting shot and being permanently disabled. She gulped her oxygen. They aren't really equipped to handle my care in prison. I could get that five years on house arrest and... My laughter caused her to stop. Why are you laughing? She asked angrily. You sound ridiculous. I laughed. With all of the charges against you, you'd be lucky to get off with life. I stopped talking in mid-sentence as Marjorie banged on the wall. I realized that she didn't want me to mention anything about what Dana was being charged with. Dave, we could be a family again, she wheezed. Think about it. The three of us could be better than we ever were. Or, you could be all alone. Dave, if you force me to do it, I'll report you and that child to the police. She took a big pull on her oxygen. You'll be in jail right next to me, she smirked. And I'll give my kid to my mom. She'll turn her into a junior version of me in no time, and the door slammed open, and an angry Avery stormed into the room. I'm not your kid, she screamed. I'm staying with my dad. Aunt Marjorie will make sure of it. Dana just laughed, pulling a whole family out of your butt. Huh? She gasped. First Dave, now some mysterious Aunt Marjorie? She took a suck on that oxygen. Avery, it's time you joined the real world, honey. Nobody gives a shit about us. Dave is not your father. Shit. I don't even know who your father is. I could probably narrow it down to four or five guys, none of whom would ever admit to it. And even Dave. Avery Dave is only taking care of you on the off chance that he'd get to screw me again. That's why he's been so nice to you. It has nothing to do with you. It's all about me. I'm all you've got. I always have been. She sucked on the oxygen again and glared at us. Now you and Dave have to get with the program. Both of you need to tell the cops the truth. Tell them how that evil bitch made a mistake. Tell them that we were all just talking and she came in and shot me and you were going to shoot me. Your own daughter. Cried Avery. My daddy wouldn't let you. He kept getting in front of me so you couldn't. All you cared about was taking his money. Avery, sometimes you have no choices, wheezed Dana. I was only going to shoot you in the leg and you'd have been fi. So now beside being a bitch, you're a doctor? Said Avery. There are all kinds of arteries and veins that go through the legs. I could have bled out or at least lost my leg. You don't care about me at all. Avery threw herself at me as usual. And that was all it took. As I held my sobbing daughter in my arms, the door opened again and Christy ran into the room and hugged us both. Oh, I gasped in pain. Dave, what's wrong with you? Asked Dana. Your creepy boyfriend tried to shoot Christy and daddy got hit trying to... 
I could barely hear anything else before the pain washed over me. I did notice how big Dana's eyes got, and then I was out of it. As I came to, I was back in my hospital room again surrounded by, let's face it there, my family. Marjorie was as usual sitting in a chair, reading the notes from some of her cases. Patrick and Brian were pacing the floor. Amanda was trying to calm everyone down and Christy and Avery were on opposite sides of my bed, each holding onto one of my hands. Neither one of them will ever see the outside of a jail before they're 60, said Marjorie. There are too many charges against them. The murder of those homeless people alone would put them away until they're well into their 50s. Then there's the robbery, fleeing the scene of a crime, and with all of the new charges like home invasion and everything related to Dave getting shot. Promise me that, Aunt Marjorie, said Avery. My eyes were barely open as Christy looked across me at Avery. Honey, that isn't quite true, she said. My mom isn't really your aunt. Avery's face fell. I couldn't believe that Christy could be that cruel. Even Amanda looked up and Brian stopped pacing to look at her. She's more like your step-grandma, continued Christy. But she's too young to be a grandma, said Avery. I breathed a sigh of relief. Marjorie, with an amused smile on her face, adjusted her reading glasses. I like being Aunt Marjorie, she said. Yeah. Well, don't get used to it, Granny, said Christy. Now that Dave is awake, we need to have that talk that I tried to have with you guys almost a week ago. I'm not awake, I mumbled. And I'm in too much pain to agree to anything. Yeah, well, you shouldn't have been out of bed anyway, growled Christy. You popped nearly all of your stitches and you were already weak, so. I. Me. I popped my stitches? I gasped. I seemed to recall a tiny redhead, nearly squeezing the shit out of me and. Well, your memory was probably foggy from the blood loss, said Christy. So anyway, now that this is all over with, I need to say something and it concerns. Wait a minute, said Brian, you're not going to tell us that you want our apartment back and. Did you say, our apartment? Asked Christy. You aren't staying with my sis? Amanda crossed the room and wrapped her arm around a stuttering Brian. I squeezed her hand. Christy, honey, get to your announcement, I said tersely. What's wrong with you? She asked. Davy. I'm sorry I squeezed you and popped your stitches. Davy, I, I love you so much and, every eye in the room popped open widely. Why are you all staring at me? Asked Christy. So okay, I admitted it. I love Dave. Big deal. I love Avery too. And I love my mom. And I love Amanda and Pat. I love you too. Thanks for putting up with me for all of these years. But I'm ready to be an adult now and, wait, um, what about me? Asked Brian. What about you? Asked Christy. Brian faded under her gaze. We're gonna have a talk when this is over, she said. Anyway, Christy continued. I'm sure that none of you realize this, but Dave has asked me to marry him. Several times, quipped Marjorie. At least, added Patrick. Can I goddamn finish? Spat Christy. Please do, said Amanda. Patrick and Marjorie just nodded. I still can't believe that I'm the only person in the room that she doesn't love, mumbled Brian. Okay, I'm shutting up. I've decided to accept Dave's proposal and, she started. Wait a minute, you turned me down last time I asked, I said. That's true, said Patrick. Christy, he was really hurt. I had to try to convince him that he had to keep try. He looked around the room and stopped talking. So, then I'm asking you to marry me, said Christy. I'll have to think about it, I said. I mean Dana is back and, Davy, don't make me put my foot up your ex-wife's butt, spat Christy. I'm still pissed at her for pointing a gun at my baby. I mean Avery. And besides you don't have a choice. You're mine and you know it. I can have you. Just like that. I'm mostly doing this because I'm gonna need Avery. Me? Said Avery in surprise. Yep. Honey, I need your expertise. As an advisor. Said Christy. I hate to mention this but you had a pretty bad mother. The worst. Spat Avery. And I don't want to be a bad mom. Said Christy. So. I'm gonna need you to tell me when I screw up. With either one of you. So, you're gonna be my mom? Asked Avery. Christy nodded. And then the two of them started hugging. Right across my bed and right over me. Please don't hug me. I laughed. Holy shit. It's about time. Sighed Patrick. Finally. Gushed Amanda. What do you mean finally? Hissed Christy. Amanda's pretty face reddened. And with her caramel skin, it was a hard thing to do. Um, we've all been. Hinted Patrick. Waiting. Continued Marjorie. For what? Asked Christy. Honey, the three of us all love you too, said Marjorie. And after the incident, you've been kind of stunted emotionally and... So, you all thought I was goddamn crazy, huh? Asked Christy. Of course not, said Amanda. 
After what you went through, it just didn't seem fair to throw it in your face and throw what in my face? Asked Christy. Let's just say that we can have a double wedding, said Marjorie. Oh, hell no, spat Christy. I'm not even inviting that a-hole to my wedding, let alone having him in it. So, you think I'm an a-hole? Asked a crushed Patrick. Of course not, Pat, gushed Christy. I was talking about Brian. Who are you gonna marry? Um, that would be where I come in, said Marjorie. How long has this been going on? Asked a clearly shocked Christy. Forever, piped in Amanda. I can't believe you didn't see it. Honey, they always seem to show up within seconds of each other, I said. And Patrick treats you as much like his daughter as he does Amanda. Remember when we had our big argument and we went to your mom's house and there were two coffee cups on her table, like someone had been there with her? Dave, you should be a cop, said Patrick. Okay, mom, we'll have a double wedding, grumbled Christy. Make it a triple, gushed Amanda. Screw that, said Christy. No way, Jose. Christy, whined Amanda. You always call me your sister. I know he's a goofball, but I love him. Okay, said Christy, grudgingly. Just keep him out of my sight. What did you mean, either one of you? Asked Brian. When you were talking to Avery, you said you didn't want to screw up with either one of you. I get Avery becoming your daughter. Do you have another kid stashed somewhere? Is that why you act so crazy all the goddamn time? Everybody looked at Brian. What? He asked. We're getting married. I'm part of the family now. I can ask questions too. Yeah, but not dumb ones, baby doll, said Amanda. Christy. Well, she was a virgin when that awful thing happened to her and luckily, she didn't end up pregnant from it. And since then, for the rest of her life, she's never done it with anyone, ever, until she met Dave and, and got pregnant with Avery's little brother or sister, said Christy. Davey, I was gonna tell you later. I guess it's my fault. But crap, it had been so long since. I mean, I wasn't on the pill because there was no reason for me to even. This time I hugged her. Thankfully, my stitches didn't pop. The only thing that did finally pop was my second stage. The little rocket ship I called my life finished its course correction and headed rapidly for the outer reaches of space. Any lingering attachment to Dana and my old life was jettisoned and I, or actually we soared. Dana got 45 years. The judge was especially shocked by the fact that she'd been willing to shoot her own child. Dana's claim that she was only going to shoot her in the leg was quickly ridiculed. Are you a trained marksman? The judge asked her. Well, um no, replied Dana. How much experience do you have shooting guns? Asked the judge. None actually, said Dana. So, what if you'd missed? Asked the judge. You could very likely have hit an artery or other vital area in the leg. You could have missed the leg entirely and shot her in the abdomen. You sound like a complete idiot and a psychopath. In fact, everything you've said in my court points to the fact that you've spent your entire life trying hard not to take any kind of responsibility for anything you've done. It was always left up to someone else to make a sacrifice or clean up your mess. You screwed around with a lot of guys. Mostly so you didn't have to work. When you got pregnant, you counted on other people, including your own unfit mother to take care of her. I shudder to think what may have become of that child if you hadn't lucked into finding Mr. Thomas. As for your injuries and your claim that incarceration is unnecessary considering your degree of infirmity, I suggest that you do what you do with the air in your oxygen tank. Suck it up. I have no intention of showing you any leniency because you got shot by a police officer who acted to prevent you from shooting a child. But none of that ever happened, Dana whined. Dave is just trying to get back at me. He's brainwashed my daughter into going along with it, and his pet cop is in love with him. Their testimony is suspect because of, um, collusion. You sound like an idiot, spat the judge. Have you heard Mr. Thomas testify? Or even your daughter? They didn't have to. The house has a video security system. Even your lawyer has seen the tape and it's horrifying. The parts with Mr. Thomas dancing around in circles trying to stay between your daughter and the barrel of your gun. Disgust me. You are going to jail and if I had my way, you'd never get out. In Jasper's case, there was even less talking. Jasper had a different judge. So, what do you have to say for yourself? Asked the judge. Well, your honor. I, began Jasper. Nothing. Just like I thought, said the judge interrupting him before he even got started. What are you going to do when you finally get out? Asked the judge. I'm going to clean up my AC. Began Jasper. Nothing. Spat the judge, cutting Jasper off even more vehemently. Because you're not getting out. I broke all of your charges down and sentenced you to serve them consecutively, not concurrently. That means that you won't serve any sentence until the one before it has been completed. So even if some bleeding heart parole board tries to let you pull a Mother Teresa and paroles you, 
You go right back into jail to start on the next conviction. You're going to serve the two murder sentences, one after another. You got 25 years for each one. By the time the murder convictions have been done, you'll be 85 years old when you start serving the sentence for shooting Mr. Thomas while trying to kill a police officer. You'll be 105 when you start serving your sentence for the home invasion with a gun. After that's over, there's the original robbery. Get the picture? I'm appealing, said Jasper. I don't think anyone finds you appealing and I've spoken to both your partner in crime, who swears that you blackmailed her into all of this and your wife who hates the ground you slither over. But just out of curiosity, what grounds will you base your appeal on? Dana got a lot less time than I did, said Jasper. Miss Thomas had two things going for her, said the judge. The first was the fact that she passed a lie detector test. She really had no idea that the two people you used as stand-ins weren't already dead. So, she didn't have the murder charges to deal with. And secondly, she was smarter than you are. Dana's as dumb as a box of rocks, screamed Jasper. What did she ever do that was so smart? She got herself shot, said the judge. So even though you're both guilty as sin, she got a lighter sentence in a nicer prison due to her life-altering injuries. Jasper was silent as they took him away. The entire courtroom was quiet except for one woman in a too tight dress who was clapping her hands and cheering. Strangely enough, her husband never looked at her as he passed her, and she only stopped clapping long enough to slap the shit out of him and then continued clapping and cheering. Christy and I, along with Marjorie and Patrick, and Amanda and Brian all got married. We took separate honeymoons. Christy and I went on a cruise. Marjorie and Pat went to Europe to visit historic castles, and Amanda and Brian went to Florida to chase theme parks. Avery went with Christy and me, although I did offer to let her stay home with her grandmother. Avery grew into a beautiful and smart young woman. She didn't become an engineer though. I never saw it coming. In college, out of the blue, she switched her major to criminal justice and after 20 years as the town's assistant DA, took over for her grandma Marjorie. Christy and I had a son first. We named him Harry, after Christy's dad. To make sure that people knew he wasn't named after a certain English prince, we used Christie's family name as his middle name. Harry and all of our kids, we had three more, grew up surrounded with love. Harry was always covered in dirt and loved to play in the mud. So much so that it earned him a nickname that followed him into the police academy and into law enforcement. Surely, you've heard of Dirty Harry Callahan. As I write this, I've just turned 70 and Christie is in her late 60s. We're still hale and healthy and available for babysitting a veritable army of grandkids. A week or so ago, a lawyer called us, out of the blue, and asked Christy if we'd be willing to sign off on an early parole for Dana. She told us that she was trying to get a few concerned citizens together because that hard DA in our town wasn't willing to let a 70-year-old woman in failing health out of jail. She told us that Dana was no longer a threat to the public and she counted on our support. Christy told the woman to look up Dana's history with the DA and see if she still wanted to let her out of jail. Then she hung up on her. People always talk about two old people sitting in rocking chairs on their front porch. We don't have that. We have a big old porch swing on our deck. We sit in it, together, with our arms wrapped around each other, while Christy sips her cocoa and munches on a cookie. Sometimes we talk, but mostly we just hold on to each other. That phone call seems to have stayed with Christy. She still has a bit of a temper after all of these years. You know we could have called Avery and asked her to let Dana out, I said, out of the blue, you're still carrying a torch for that 304, she spat, moving away from me. No honey, I said, the only things anybody is gonna be carrying for Dana are probably her enormous sagging, 70-year-old body. I fell over tea kettle for a crazy, beautiful, redhead 40 years ago when she walked into my office one morning, out of nowhere. She smiles at me and then moves back to her spot beside me. Christy's hair is mostly gray now with some streaks through it that still show off the fiery red color she was born with. I'm a little bit slower than you are, Davy. she smiles. It hit me less than an hour later, though. I saw you crying over that worthless bitch you'd married, and I knew I loved you. That's why I came over and just hugged you, after spending that first hour arguing and sniping with you. It just hit me. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.